Hey folks, my name is Yash. You probably know I post a lot of content on generative AI on YouTube. So I finally decided to invest some time and build out a mini course on generative AI since a lot of you have reached out to me in the past. Um, this is a two hour course that will cover the following topics that you see on the screen right now. As you can see, we cover everything from text to video to audio to image generation tools. So by the end of this video, you'll have clear understanding of all the available tools at your disposal. Not only that, you'll be comfortable using these tools um, as per your use case. So we also cover some latest topics like web browsing and BARD extensions. And we also cover some general topics like prompt engineering, AI QR code generation, which are more on the lines of use cases. I've also covered uh, 100 short video generations and so on and so forth. So just to give you a quick uh, context on these, the initial ones are around ChatGPT. So broadly uh, with respect to what is ChatGPT, how 4.5 works, web browsing feature, GPT-3 and GPT-4 uh, comparison, then BARD extension, which is again relatively nascent. And and then we move on to the image generation tools and these are uh, save mid journey both of these are free then we talk about image prompt generation and this is where we use chat gpt to generate image prompts then we talk about video generation where we cover all you know these tools uh, snappy for video and gen 2 for video generation then gpt 4.5 interpreter and talk about you know how to generate code with or how to automate your code generation with ai so we you know look at gpt 4.5 and then like i said we talk about the use cases we also cover some extra tools like gen one and SDXL and finally we cover QR code generation it's a free model on hugging face and then we use prompt engineering um, you know quick overview for you to do prompt engineering if you are either aware or you want to skip any of these topics feel free to do so um, there will be chapters where you can decide to move between one or the other chapters depending on what you want to skip or what you want to continue learning so Feel free to experiment and play around that. Just a quick note, while the order of the course does make sense, so you can see we go from image to, you know, text to image to video to code to use cases, the context across videos is not maintained. For example, I won't be saying things like what we learned in the previous lecture or what we'll learn in the next lecture because these videos are disconnected in a way given these tools were released across different timelines. But that should not impact how you learn given the logical order of the flow is maintained. So yeah, I think that's... Uh, uh, all you need to know before you jump into the course without wasting any more time let's just you know jump right in and start with the first lecture per se i think i made this course back in back in january and things have massively changed since then right the whole gpt3 uh, video that i had made for the first lecture is completely revamped now so i'm making this new video uh, in april I think April, May, in order to kind of help you understand what has changed and how the GPT 3, 3.5 or 4, whichever you are on right now, looks like, right? So I'm on GPT 3.5 and 4, I'm a paid user and I love interacting with GPT 4. It's way better than GPT 3 or 3.5. Effectively, the basic functionality remains the same, right? So it retains context from your previous question. So if you ask a question at the start, it knows how to kind of answer, you know, how to give future answers, keeping aligned with the first question that you had asked or the subsequent previous questions that you had asked right so all of that is still in place right and it's very likely that you already know what chat gpt is in order to access it, access it just go to chat.openai.com and then you have to sign up using a phone number and an account and you'll be able to come to something like this you get a pop-up saying that it's an experiment stage and you will have an option somewhere here on the left side to buy gpt plus if you're interested but before i go forward with this ensure that you in install this plugin save gpt i'll tell you why right so when you're talking to these models it's very uh very much possible that you're copying and pasting your personal data and things like your phone number email may get leaked out right so for example i just put my phone number you feed it to chat gpt it knows it's a 10 digit number and because it's self-learning it will kind of feed this number to someone else in the future right so i'd recommend getting this plugin from the chrome chrome dashboard google chrome extension store and search for safe gpt You'll find this plugin, just install it. I'll show you what it does, right? So I, I've already installed it, I'll enable it. And now let's look at this. You can see before I even send anything to the model, it kind of masks the data, right? And this is very important when you're working with large language models because these models are self-training and it's possible that whatever data you feed to the model, it's eventually kind of, you know, fed to someone else right so ensure that you have this in place next uh, let's quickly talk about the interface this is these are your chat history per se right so everything you ask is kind of maintained here so if i open something you'll see that um, 
the model has kind of saved the data here for you to come, kind of come back and then refer. You can delete chat, you can edit the name of the chat. Uh, these are your options if you want to configure your plan, clear conversations, etc. But that's pretty much it about the UI, right? So you can kind of uh, give suggestions for the answers, download the answers, etc. etc. I'm going to quickly kind of show you, uh, you know, the basics are clear, right? So it's pretty straightforward that way. I'm going to quickly show you what else you can do. Uh, when you're using chat GPT, right? The kind of questions you can ask to chat GPT. So I'm going to do five things, right? So for example, say you are a digital marketing manager. You're working on a website called, say, video silence remover, right? So let's say, can you create a plan, SEO plan for video silence remover? So this is a website and I wanted to kind of build a plan for me. Right? So it went ahead and kind of created a high level plan with respect to what we should do. It says, you know, do keyword research, optimize website content, build quality backlinks. So let's say we wanted some keywords, right? So let's say, can you give me some popular? So it say, can you give me some popular keywords? And then it kind of went ahead and gave you the keywords. Now let's say I wanted to kind of take one keyword and write a blog for that keyword, right? And you learn more about how blogs work and you know, what is prompt, how to write great prompts in order to get great responses from ChatGPT. So don't worry about that. Throughout this lecture, you'll learn everything you need to know about ChatGPT, right? So let's say I take this prompt, video noise reduction, and can you write a blog on the topic Let's say this, right? So can you write a blog on the topic video noise reduction, 800 words, stone to be helpful and SEO keyword to be video silence remover. The minute you feed something like this, it kind of writes the whole blog for you, which is then, um, you know, there may be some issues with plagiarism and, and I'll show you how to kind of avoid that too in this section. So don't worry about that. But it kind of went ahead and wrote the entire blog for us. And this is effectively what ChatGPT is. It has all the data in, on the internet. It kind of, you know, mixes that data to create permutation combination depending on what you need to do, right? So it understands your question. It understands how your question was answered by someone else in the past on the internet. It kind of makes its own approach based on that to give you answer. And this is not it, right? So this is just not it. Now I'll tell you how creative it can get. Let's say, can you write a song on video? Let's say we ask this, right? So can you write a song on video silence in order? So you can see it went ahead and created a verse, chorus, verse to chorus, bridge, chorus, outro. Now for a human to do this, right? It would take a lot of time. It would take a lot of thinking time and the song is not bad, right? So got some footage that you need to clean, but the noise is making it hard to clean. <laughs> Don't sweat it. We've got the thing. Video silence remover, let us sing. So something on these lines, right? So it also understands thing, sing, clean, glean, go, flow, out, cloud, cake, take. For a human, this is hard to do, but a machine is able to do that for us, right? Next, let's try, can you make it a rap song? So you can see it kind of converted the whole song into a more rap version of that song for the same video silence remover, right? And I didn't say that, can you write a rap song for video silence remover, but it understood that I'm asking it for the video silence remover. Next, let's say we wanted to write a story on this. Can you write a story on this? So Samantha has been working on the latest video projects for weeks. She had poured her heart and soul into it, disappointed. Samantha turned to video silence remover. She had heard great things about the noise reduction tool and decided to give it. So I think at this point, you get the point, right? The kind of things it can do. And at this point, I use Google less and I use um, chat GPT more. Uh, and this is not just the end of it, right? So let's say I wanted to build like a HTML page for video silence remover. So let's say, can you build an HTML page. So basically what I'm trying to say is that it can also write code for you. So if you tell this, right, it will go ahead and create like an HTML page for you. And this is code. If you copy this code and you paste it on an HTML. So you can see I pasted this here and it's able to kind of give me a preview of how this page would look. Obviously this is not great. There is a lot of design improvement that needs to be done and something that you can also rely on ChatGPT to do, right? So can you make it look 
and you can see it kind of invests that time. Uh, again, this is GPT 3.5, so sometimes it may not be able to do it. So let's say, can you you create a CSS file? So CSS is basically responsible for the look and feel of the website, and it went ahead and did that, right? So this is the kind of capability that Chat GPT offers you if you're not using it yet. I'd recommend start learning it ASAP because it's not only going to be impacting everything that you work with, it's going to be impacting every job role. And I would recommend like it's better to adopt it to get better than, you know, repent it and maybe wait for the right time to adopt it. I think it's the right time. You you have everything you need. You have this course. Use that to your advantage and kind of start using GPT for your own benefit. In the next lecture, we'll ask these same questions on a GPT-4 model. And I'll show you the difference between GPT-3.5 or 3 and GPT-4. So we'll ask exact same questions. So you know the kind of quality GPT-4 uh, offers to you, right? So I'm just going to copy and create like that. Okay, let's see you guys in the next lecture. Hey guys, so ChatGPT web browsing went live again yesterday and I want to talk about nine use cases that are really interesting. I think three of them don't work right now, but these are, you know, generic use cases and definitely should work uh, with GPT-4. So maybe they'll start working in the future. Right now, let me just quickly jump to the nine use cases that I find really interesting. So first one, it can actually browse to websites and, you know, give you feedback. So if you have a website, you're looking to get some feedback with respect to the content that you have on the website or the way your website is structured, it can definitely give you some feedback. So I just tried Snappy's website. Uh, let me just put the prompt here. Can you review snappy.ai website and share some bits that I can improve? Uh, before I go there, in order to enable this, you need GPT-4 and you need to enable browse with Bing option, right? So once you have that handy, just go ahead and start playing around. It can literally browse the internet. One thing I've noticed is sometimes it will use the pre-existing knowledge that it already has to give you answers. So you'll have to specify clearly in the bracket saying browse internet, right? And this will happen specifically for cases where the information existed even in 2021. So it will prioritize information that it already has before it starts browsing the internet. So if you want it to specifically browse the internet ensure that you mention that bit about browse internet anyways i think snappy is recent so it won't have that information let me just put this prompt here and show you snappy for one second you can see this is the website and it's going to be reviewing this whole website and give me suggestions with respect to how i can improve this i'll ask some follow-up questions here so that you have understanding on what else you can do so you can see there are several, several areas of improvement, no surprise. The user interface could benefit from clear de delineation between sections for enhanced navigation. The community generation lacks contextual information regarding its purpose. The section building in public could explain the metrics being shared. The FAQ section is informative but, informative could, but could be visually separated to enhance readability. You can see all of these bits are static elements, right? So now it knows that there is some text here and text is, you know, kind of compressed in like this whole section. So it knows that there is too much text in one section that makes sense to kind of separate it out. Then there is, I think, a build in public section in the bottom. Yeah, you show you go. There is the feedback section and community generation obviously has no context because it has videos, which it does not go through right now. So yeah, I mean, these are pretty good actionable feedback. And obviously not all of them are meaningful because it still doesn't know which feedback means what. But I think it's a good starting point for people who are looking to merely just do first cut review of their content and you know make some changes. I think suggest some changes or improvements that can be implemented right away. And it can use the pre-existing knowledge that it has with the new knowledge that it has gained about your website and give you some actionable feedback on what you can do. So I think this is one of the coolest use cases for the new web browsing chat GPT. The other thing I also noticed that it's relatively faster than the previous version when it would take a lot of time to browse through these sections. All right, let's move on to the next use case. Okay, this should work, but apparently it does not work, right? So. So I would, you know, given the fact that ChatGPT can now do real-time browsing, one of the most important use cases would be to kind of browse the news and maybe write articles, blogs, or tweets about the latest news per se, but apparently that does not work, right? So let's say summarize today's news. It'll obviously go ahead and browse and try to find some article. 
but what it throws out is the fact that it's it, it can't access it. let's just see oh it, it's working so initially when i tried doing this it wasn't working and i was surprised because this is one of the coolest use cases you can have with chat gpt so let's say you know you found today's news and it's procedural U- us senate and house and made a looming government shutdown and a bunch of different news articles now you can use these to create say tweets on these articles right which is our third use case where we'll tell it to you know maybe Right. generate a conversational feed on all of these items so basically you can automate taking by taking this news and generating like a whole thread of news and auto post on certain channels right so you can see this is the first one second one third one and so on and so forth so this is one of you know one of the good use cases for marketing agencies or you know channels that post a lot of news basically you can just get news summarized with gpt and automate all of that you know automate posting all of that online so really cool use case even the fourth use case i like a lot especially if you are from a more on you know more consulting or a research background you typically want to read a lot of market reports you know generate some summaries of those market reports now you can basically do that using gpt right so let's say generative ai market report for of 2023 it can literally browse the website websites and figure out a report to refer to then summarize that report for you now it's gone to mckenzie.com for this report let's see what it throws out you can see it's a pretty interesting report obviously it's not very very detailed but it went ahead and kind of you know generated a very very high level summary of this i don't know if it can still write blog my last attempt failed so let me just give it another shot so we tell it to write a 900 word blog on this topic yeah so however i can provide guidance key points so it's saying i can assist in drafting on the insights but however so i i don't get it right is there a specific angle or an aspect All right so we tell it to write a generic blog with the keyword generative ai market report 2023 let's see Yeah, it's working and it's pretty cool because now obviously it isn't deep diving on each of these aspects, but it's you know giving you a high level summary of what the blog could have. Now I can understand why it isn't writing blog because you know the minute it starts doing that, the whole internet will start writing blog by using web browser. But let's see if we can you know give another prompt and see if it can write the blog for us. So 900 word blog. Let's see if it can attempt it. Yeah, I tried this before and it just won't write a blog post. And I can understand why that that would be the case. Maybe there are ways in order you know ways in which you can actually engineer a prompt where it thinks it's not writing a blog, but maybe it's writing a blog. So for example, you can say write a summary for this paragraph or this title, maybe a hundred word summary. And then you can tell it to do it for all of these, and that's kind of a blog for you. But yeah, anyways, so this is I think the fifth use case. Yeah, I think that was the fifth use case. Let's look at the uh, sixth one. This is get another favorite one. So if you're again a researcher, someone who, you know, reads about the market a lot or maybe you're in consulting, then you can, you know, use this maybe just, you know, dig up top 10 trends of 2023. So if you're from marketing background and you're looking to kind of do a quick analysis or maybe you're a student doing homework or an assignment, I think this can do the first cut or maybe it can help you with the research. So it's almost like your extended hand when it comes to doing research. So it went ahead and I think it referred some sort of report and it brought out four major trends of 2023. Uh while like clearly told it to bring me the top 10 most uh, important trends. It's fine like because I understand that it went through a web page it found a web page with that gave it the exact content it wanted and then it kind of threw out the content out. Uh yeah. So if you read through this you'll find four more, you know, um it went only through half of the article and then kind of summarized that. Which is fine because I think at some point the context window will increase and then one Once that happens maybe we'll get through the list of the whole article all right the next one is an interesting where you want to do a feature study of plot 2 versus gpt4 let's see what it throws out i i don't know if it will do this or maybe it will you know maybe it will find comparison or an article that can summarize this for it so let's just throw the question out and see what we get all right firstly it's not browsing the internet this is similar to what i had mentioned before but it does have some information right so it's clearly claiming plot 2 is not widely recognized model in public domain as of the last training cut off it's just using the information it has let's see can you browse the internet and get me the latest info let's see what it what it does so it's on anthropic right now browsing through the website which is expected all right so it's obviously gone through and you know gave out the information about plot 2 can you compare it with gpt4 Let's see if it can give us that information. Yeah, it's <laughs> it does not have information about GPT-4. Can you browse the internet? 
let's see it can get frustrating especially when you have to prompt it again and again so finally it's looking for the exact same thing we wanted to and it found this website where it's browsing the yeah you know so if you expect it to know all of this that's not the case it's basically just opening website summarizing that information and throwing it out so yeah I think that's this one as our sixth use case. It's pretty interesting. Like, like if you are a product manager, you want to do some research. Uh, I think this can be really helpful. All right. So the next one is on the lines of writing code. If you have, you know, code written code before next JS 13 is a more recent release and GPT does not have access Chat GPT does not, did not previously have access to this. So let's see if it can, you know, help us with the new version of next JS 13 road. If you work with next JS 13, you know what I'm talking about. Interesting. It's going through the GitHub website. Okay. So it can also go back. So it went to the website, it went back and now I think it's looking at, I think uh, the last time I searched this question it went to the same website it went to github again so pretty interesting like it can crawl through the different it's a, you know it's just giving me general information that it's different but it's confused if it should proceed with what it already knows versus should it do more research right let's push it to do research anyways and see what it throws out i wonder with you know browsing all the links does it give you any credit i'm sure it won't give you any credit on google for because you know these guys are competing yeah so it's not helping with this last time around when i tried this it actually gave out some output but this time it's very lazy all right so let's try youtube this is one of my recent videos let's see if we can do youtube q a so i'm asking what is this video about see let's see if it can give us the some insight yeah it's not working on videos the last time around i tried it had the same feedback but I am really looking forward to an AI that can, you know, answer my video. So anywho, the last time, one of the most, you know, practical use cases that at least I can think of with respect to the real time browsing is actually finding relevant keywords and blog topics to write. So let's say top keywords for snappy AI, please refer the website before sharing because it's not going to browse otherwise. Let's say, so this is an overkill. I'm, you know, telling it to look at for the relevant keywords for snappy AI, and then also look at competitors that are ranking for it and give me ideas that are easy and faster to rank. All right. So it's on snappy now. So it identified the keywords for sure. Yeah. But it won't go ahead and give me some idea. All right. So let's just go ahead and try and push it to see uh, what kind of competitors are ranking for this idea. Okay. A bunch of these are ranking now. All right. So what topics do you suggest I write blogs on to rank for this keyword? So again, these are all the keywords that it might have found across these competitors. So it may make sense to kind of, you know, deep dive on this thread and see what you can dig for your own website or maybe write blogs on specific keywords. But yeah, I think these are the nine use cases that at least I can think of at this point. There are obviously more. And if you can think of any use cases, feel free to drop those in the comments. But as of right now, this is really, really cool, uh, like super cool. It almost destroyed all the excitement around Bard. And I'd recommend you give it a shot, at least for roasting your own website. But yeah, that's all guys. Thank you so much and have a great rest of the day. See you. Hey guys, welcome to this next lecture. In this video, we're going to be looking at GPT-4 and we'll ask the same questions that we had, we had asked in the previous lecture on GPT-3.5 model. Now, note that GPT-4 is relatively slower to answer questions than GPT-3.5. And this primarily is because it's giving out very meaningful and useful answers compared to what GPT-3.5 throws out. So I had invest some time in GPT-3.5 to fine tune answers, right? So for example, look at this question. So I said, can you make it look uh, better somewhere, right? Yeah. And it said it, it gave me some ideas on how to do it. And then I had to ask a question that was very specific. Can you create a CSS file? So GPT-4 kind of understands all of these nuances. And it works very closely with you to not to kind of give you the answers that you need and very quality answers. So let's try the same questions now. Again, if you've not installed Save GPT, I'd recommend uh, installing it. It's completely free. It's not taking any personal data. So I don't see a reason why you want to install it. Right? It will only protect your private information. So let's say we ask the same question right? to GPT-4 this time. It takes a while to answer the questions. You can see it's kind of, we will look at somehow we're able to Okay, you can see conduct keyword research, optimize website content, build quality backlinks, video content, social media. You look at how it's answering the question. Right? It's giving you keywords that you should be targeted. And these are right keywords. Right? So if you look at the keywords that it suggested, these are not the right keywords to target. We look at GPT-4 answers. These are exactly the keywords that video silence remover should target. It gives you optimize uh, what to optimize, how to guides. And there is video content 
relevant keywords in the description, technical SEO, XML sitemap, SSL certificates, on-site, on-page SEO, off-page SEO. So while it's relatively slower, the kind of answers that it gives out are way detailed than GPT-3 or 3.5. Now let's say we ask the same follow-up question, uh, this one. So can you give me some popular keywords? You can see it's kind of giving out uh, keywords that are broader and also that may be relevant for your use case. It gave out 10 keywords and these are generic keywords, but look at this, it gave out 20, the ones that are really good to target. And it knows all of that because it's kind of scraped all the data from the internet. Let's say we tell it to do the same thing, video noise reduction, Let's say we use remove background noise from video. Also note the limitation with uh, GPT-4, is that you can only ask 25 questions every three hours at this point between April and May. So that's primarily because it's very computing heavy and consumes a lot of resources compared to GPT 3.5, which is also why it's, I think, paid. But yeah, it's limited. So I think that piece of information kind of helps you. It's not, you cannot ask questions all day. So 25 questions every three hours, which means you can at max ask 200, 300 questions a day on your most effective uh, day, right? So... You can see how detailed the blog post is compared to this one, right? It's GPT 3.5 isn't bad, but if you put this answer in a plagiarism detector versus this one, this one works way better because this seems more of an original answer, but it also kind of takes time to process. Compared to this one, it kind of, it's just taking most information that it found online. It's kind of putting all of that together, right? So it seems more machine-like, but the answers from this seem more human. Now let's say, can you write a song on video silence remover? So honestly, like in cases like these, where tasks are either not code or writing blogs, there is not much difference between GPT 3.5 and GPT 4. It's all very similar. Like who, why would you want to write a song? Where, where would you want to publish? Unless you're running like a YouTube channel that kind of creates songs for these, then it may make sense. But otherwise the responses are more or less very similar, right? Again, if you write a rap song, it's not going to change much. You write a story that may kind of be different because GPT-4 can write detailed stories. Also, while it's kind of writing the story, it can also give the title. You can see there is no title here, but it gave title. It started with once upon a time itself. Yeah. So while I'm also here, also ensure that you kind of label these. You can see I've kind of added OPO guy GTM, mean gen GTM, fatty GPT GTM. Uh, ensure that you kind of give out the titles, relevant titles, because um, after a point, you'll have so many things. It will become very, very hard to kind of uh, track each of your items, right? So ensure that you label them well and you arrange them. And you can ask, and you should probably create threads like these where you go inside them and you continue to ask questions, right? So, so that you don't end up creating so many threads. It will become like a management nightmare for yourself. Next, uh, once this is done, we'll also kind of ask it to write the code for us. And let's see how that works out. Code-wise, I found GPT-4 to be way accurate. While GPT-3.5 gives out good uh, code samples, GPT-4 is great at, you know, when you're asking follow-up questions, trying to understand uh, what means what, or maybe debugging something. GPT-4 does a way better job there. So it's kind of creating these lists. I don't know how uh, acquainted you are with code, but like with GPT-4, you can create a very great uh, websites without actually having so much tech support, right? So I've done it for a few of my own uh, products or you know, a few of my own use cases, writing Python scripts, etc. So I definitely recommend uh, doing that for yourself. So you want to create a separate CSS to style your web page. And let's ask the same question and see if it understands what we want, want to do with the web page, right? So yeah, see, it knows that I'm asking for the CSS code and directly gave me this code. Right? GPT 3.5 didn't do that for me, right? But GPT 4 understands what I want and it kind of does that. Right? So I paste it here. And you can see it kind of created. It's again not beautiful. You can add a CSS file in order to make it look great. But yeah, I would say this is not bad. This is decent work uh, to start off. And that's pretty much it for the uh, lecture itself. Over the next few lectures, I think you'll learn what are prompts, what is prompt engineering, um, you know, it's repository of prompts, etc., etc. But ensure, again, before I go, ensure that you have this plugin on because it will protect your private information. It's not taking any private information. You can go to the Chrome web store. It's not taking any private information. So ensure that you have this plugin. All right, guys, let's move on to the next lecture.
Google Bar just had a major update and I'm not even going to be explaining you what the update is. I'm just going to show you, right? So you can literally put prompts and ask questions about your documents. You can see I've asked latest email about snappy.ai summarize it. It's kind of gone through my email box and it's kind of taken the latest email and it's summarized the email for me, which is insane. It's, it's now looking through my Google workspace not only gmail but it can actually look through a bunch of different things right so it can look through your drive your docs and get quick answers for you i don't know how it's maintaining the personal information uh, while it's doing all that but it's able to now look through everything you need to know the most insane part about all of this though is that can actually now also look through youtube right so all of those apps that you know would ask allow you to ask questions to youtube videos you can do that on bard for free now so let's say we go ahead and try it out, right? So let's say we do research a topic. So I'm just going to be very straightforward and I'm going to ask if it can find my own YouTube channel that talks about AI no code and product management. Let's see what it throws out. So you can see it's looking through YouTube now. Huh, interesting. So it's kind of looking, it's kind of search this uh, channel name, which is not really the case. So let's say, can you find, so I'm just going to fix my habit of writing bad grammar to chat GPT. And I'm going to ask, I'm going to use decent grammar and ask this question to Bard now and see if it can genuinely put some attempt to find my YouTube channel. I'd be very happy if it can do that for me. Okay. It's looking through YouTube. Oh, it found me. So it found a YouTube channel called Yash, formerly known as TechWhip, talking about AI. So definitely cool. So let's see if it can answer certain top questions for me. So I'm asking if it can find my top videos. I don't know if it can maintain the context here, but yeah, it kind of ruined it. So it's kind of brought some generic answers about Yash, but not really. So while it's great, right, it can find stuff on YouTube. It can not, it can at this point, I don't think it can do some deep search. Let me just go to my channel and pick a video. See the link is correct. All right, so the link is correct. I'm just going to pick this snappy demo and see if it can summarize it for me. Right, That's weird. So I'm just going to tell it to summarize this video for me. This is, I think one of my latest uploads. So I hope, yeah, it can answer. It can't answer questions about YouTube content right now, which means that the apps that allow you to ask questions are still relevant so it's fine so let's try something else all right so i'm gonna say show me flights to dubai in the week of january 24 give me gift ideas for a friend let's see what it throws out i like the cool new animation where it's kind of showing like the integration of bar with multiple services so that's pretty cool all right so it's kind of brought me a bunch of flights it's kind of taking november as the starting location and to dubai it's also got me some prizes here and then there are certain personalized gifts. You can also see it's kind of listed down certain flights during that timeline, which is very, very cool. I don't know, man. I, I think at this point I can still, I can, I, I, I can do this on Google, right? You know, the update is pretty cool, but the amount of things you can do with it right now is very limited. Like what's the point of getting YouTube videos if you can't ask questions? What's the point of getting emails if you can't really reply to these emails, right? I mean, at this point, I'd be very cautious about putting my private information on docs and uh, sheets and stuff, right? So, yeah, I, I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, but also, by the way, if you want to enable this, you need to kind of you know, connect your uh, workspace account. But yeah, overall, it's pretty cool. I mean, it's going in the right direction. I heard, recently heard about Gemini and how it's going to be one of the biggest LLMs out there, even better than ChatGPT. So I'm really excited to see where it goes. But at this point, it's very nascent. Like, it's, I think in the very first release. If you want to read more about the release, you know, feel free to kind of go to learn more. Yeah, you can go ahead and learn more about the release here. But at this point in time, I think it's pretty nascent. It's still some time before it can really kill ChatGPT. So, all right, guys, thank you so much and have a good one. Hey guys, welcome to this channel. In this video, I'm going to quickly walk you through how to use Midjourney. So this guide is relevant for people who have never used Midjourney in the past and then, you know, just start getting their hands dirty or just trying to understand how Midjourney works. It's pretty straightforward. I don't think you need any technical knowledge. You don't need to type a single line of code. The experience to use the tool is not so good, which is probably why you might have not tried it until now. But I'm just going to quickly walk you through and I'm going to keep it really, really simple for you, right? So let's get started uh, the very first step you need to do is just come to midjourney.com you can google it here and it will you know be on top of the google search itself just click on join the beta the way you use midjourney is by using discord and discord is an old school type of a chat tool right so if you use slack you may get acquainted with discord soon but remember this is where a lot of uh, you know people who are tech forward or people who are gamers hang out right so let's just go to discord now and 
understand how mid journey looks in discord and how you can start generating images in discord per se i'm going to give you a very quick overview of what discord you know ui looks like so don't worry uh i'll help you help you guys throughout the journey itself so once you click here it will pop out either in this ui if you don't have a discord discord account just go ahead and create it it's very simple it's just like any other sign up journey if you have downloaded the app it will open it in the app to create an account here so once you verify you'll be in and this is where this is how the discord ui looks like so new especially when you're joining in for the first time so i'm just gonna quickly uh, ver verify my account and we'll start okay so my email is now verified so you can see the pop-up here is gone now you go to mid journey and you click on join the beta that does not happen and you can explore public server just type okay you can see that mid journey is at the top so either you go and explore it there or you can just do, join it from here now once you uh, join here there are two channels right so mid journey is like the main public server and then there are smaller channels inside mid journey itself so there's getting started ask question i'll just look around for now so that's what we'll do okay so you click on join mid journey you verify that you're a human again once you join, you should be able to see a bunch of these groups here, right? I'm just trying to find a group where we can visualize all of this. So these are all the images that are generated by Mid Journey. You can browse the channel and look for a newbie, right? So, okay. Basically, how Mid Journey works is you need to um, type in the prompt. I don't know if your understanding of the prompt is there yet, but effectively prompts are small line of codes that you can use in order to tell the model what to generate, right? And this is the mid journey UI. Now these are all public servers, right? Primarily, the, you know, the idea behind public servers is that, and the problem behind this is that a lot of the people are using it at the same time. So you can see all of these images being generated. These are being generated right now and people are try, try, typing their own uh, prompts here. So I'm just going to go to Lexica and, you know, before I go to Lexica, let me just show you how this works. So you just say, imagine. Imagine is primarily you telling uh, Mid Journey to generate an image for you. So you can say, Elon Musk and maybe Mahabharata, right? So it's a very open ended prompt. You can give it uh, to Mid Journey. Once you click enter, uh, okay. So you need to accept the terms and services, right? Before you move forward. So once you accept that, you can see that it's a welcome message of sorts. And then once this welcome message, you should also get a message that your image generation has started. Let's just wait for the message. If that doesn't happen, let's just try it again, right? So let's just say, yeah, I think I saw the tag somewhere. Yeah, so there you go, right? Now you can see that it's generating our image. So it's tagged me, it says 0% there, and it says fast. Basically, this says that it's using a fast model and it's currently generating the image for us. Now, because this is a public image, it's often, if, if it's possible that it'll get lost in the crowd, but uh, you will be able to see, uh, you know, especially when it's your name, you'll be able to see this yellow outline by which you can identify if this is yours, right? Now, I think once the image is generated, it will again come at the bottom from where uh, you can access it. Let's just wait for it to, it takes a few seconds to generate, right? So I'm just gonna wait here uh, till the image is generated. You can see there's some progress here. Again, your goal should be to choose rooms with lower traffic. Now it's very hard to find rooms like that, but you can experiment with these rooms in order to see which room has a lower traffic. This will uh, enable you, you can see the image suddenly disappeared. What has happened It's gone at the bottom. So there you go. The image is now here. Effectively, what you need to do is ensure that you go in the room with the low traffic, uh, primarily because the lower the traffic, the better the experience, right? So you Either ways, you will not always find free groups. Mid Journey is also paid. So uh, like if you need focused access, you may want to buy a Mid Journey and access it. But if, you know, especially talking about free plan, it gives you certain amount of credits in order to generate these images. You can see the image has been generated. I'm going to show you what these are, right? So this is upscale one, upscale two, upscale three, upscale four. And this is V1, V2, V3, V4. So what this does is that if you do this, it will regenerate the whole grid of all the images. If you say U1, it will upscale the first image and give you the access to download it. If you say V1, it will take the version one and regenerate the whole 
grid based on version one. Let's try all of these ones. Uh, I want to generate more samples using the V4, right? So you click on V4, it will start another generation, right? So you can see there is one here, meaning we were tagged somewhere. And the fact that we were tagged somewhere would mean that the image generation, you can see the job has started. So the variations are now being created on the V4 of the image that we had clicked. You can see all of the variations are now similar to the ones that we had clicked. What we'll do next is we'll try to upscale one of this. So the image is done. You can see it's at the bottom and the image is now generated. Now, for example, I like say one of these images, right? So I like this first image. So I'm going to say upscale one. This will upscale the first image and it will generate a new image for me. So this is where the job would start. It's basically improving the quality of the image for me to download. I can then download that image and you know either like showcase it somewhere or just keep it for my sake per se. So let's just wait for it to um, download my image or upscale my image per se. Just again, like I said, the experience itself is not best, uh, and that happens primarily because this is a free plan right now, which is fine. I mean, in order to experiment and understand, you uh, this is completely fine. You should be able to play around if you like it. Then you can go ahead and take a look at the play, paid plan per se. So it's going to take some time to generate the image. I'm just going to pause it for a while. Okay, it looks like the image is now upscaled. It's right where it had added, right? So if I scroll to the bottom, there you go. You can see the upscale is done. Now you can create more variations off of this upscaled image. You can light upscale redo. I mean, you can rescale uh, upscale the image again. Beta upscale redo. It um, Again, I don't understand the difference between these, but effectively these are upscaling the images. You can go to the web and download this image or you can just click here and save it from here. Uh, but this won't be upscaled image, right? In order to get the upscaled image, you'll have to go to mid journey login and then download. You can go to web. Uh, that's what it does. And then you can give feedback on the generation itself. Now let's go to Lexica, which is where I find a lot of the art. Um, so I'm just gonna find something that I can generate in Mid Journey. So all of these are, by the way, generated by Stable Diffusion. And Stable Diffusion, unlike Mid Journey, is free and provides better experience uh, because it's in your own computer and you can control how you know to render images. But the problem with Mid Journey is that uh, so problem with Stable Diffusion it takes a lot of computing power, which you may sometimes not have. You need a great graphic card in order to process that. So I'm, I'm just going to go out there and tell the model to generate this view from earth moon split in half alien ships invading and sucking in earth moons 4k Okay, so basically, uh, this is what the prompt is, right? And this is how prompts work, where you have to give certain details about the subjects, the characteristics of the subjects, uh, the verbs, etc., etc. So if you're new to prompting, check out my guide on prompt engineering. It will help you master how to write the best prompts for any image generation, right? So let's just go ahead and tell the model to generate this, right? Okay, so you can see the uh, word is banned, which is fine. What we can do is we can... My goal was to talk about how earthlings are being okay. Let's just say invading earth and let's see what it generates. By the way, all of these prompts, right? You can also go ahead and download these prompts for yourself. If you, I mean, these guys, some of these guys are playing around, right? So you can go ahead and create copies of their art and save it for your model too. And that's also possible. Again, it's nothing different, right? Just go ahead and click um, V4, V2, whatever you like. This will help you save the prompt in your own model. And this is the, our prompt, the prompt that we gave. You can see it's generating it. Okay, let's just wait for it. You can see it's 62% there. Again. The whole, whole game is on how you generate or how you write prompts. If you don't write prompts well, you'll not be able to generate great images. So it's important to know how prompts work. And feel free to check out my video on prompting in order to understand how. If you're new to Generative AI, feel free to check my course out on Generative AI. It will teach you everything you need to know uh, in this space. Okay, you can see that it's split the moon, split the earth in half. Okay, let's, what you can do is you can play around with this. You can say, imagine and then remove this part 
and see what it generates. People are just playing around with this, right? Be careful uh, with the whole kind of prompts you write because it's tag literally tra- tagging you in here. So and plus it's also kind of backtracking the whole thing in the main UI. So if you put something weird uh, because it's a public so you may get called out for it. So just be careful with this. Anyways, I think that's all I kind of wanted to show you in especially what you need in order to get started with mid journey. I'm going to make make more videos on and deep dives on how to kind of master mid journey in order for your art generation. So stay tuned for that. You can generate more versions of this. You can say that you like maybe this version, which is one, two, three, and this is third version. So you can see, you can say version three more variation. So you can obviously play around more if, if you want. But if I have to talk about the basics, I think that's all you need to know, especially when you talk, you know, talking about getting started with mid journey. Uh, if you like this video, consider subscribing to the channel, drop a like on this video, share this across with a friend and I will see you guys in the next video. Thank you so much. Hey folks, you can see I've cancelled my mid-journey subscription here and it's because I'm very very confident about focus generating my new set of images. So it's similar to the web UI but it also has features that can enhance your image and make it look like mid-journey images. So you can see the only prompt that was provided here was forest elf and look at the quality of the generations, right? I've not seen these kind of generations anywhere except for mid-journey or Leonardo. Now the reason why the generations are so good is because it's still using stable diffusion excel one in the background but it's using its own rule sets in order to enhance the capabilities now to start off all you need to do is click here to download this and it's surprising how easy it is to use no wonder it has more than 6,000 stars on GitHub because it's extremely easy to use and it also has templates that you can use in order to manipulate your images. But to start off, just go ahead and download the file. I'm going to walk you through step by step on how to achieve this. So once you download, you should see something like this, uh, obviously after you extract it. Just click on run. This will do a bunch of things, right? So this will firstly download both the models in your local system. I already have it here. So if, if I go in the models checkpoints, you can see I already have both the models, but in your case, it will go ahead and download download the model for you. After the models are downloaded, that's that's pretty much all you need to do. I mean, at this point, you're set to run this in your local computer. So you can see the UI is loaded and it's extremely simple to use. All you need to do is just type a prompt. So let's say forest elf, the prompt that uh, was shown in the sample and it will you know kind of ensure that it's using the right GPUs in order to do the generation. Now I have a 4070 GPU attached to my PC. So the generation is still going to be faster relatively, but they also have a guide that you can refer in case you want, if you want to run it on the low end CPUs or low end computers, right? So you can see the guide here and you know, while it's generating, so you can also see that it's kind of generating these images in the command prompt here. Look at the kind of generations it's doing, right? So I am not genuinely not seen these type of generations anywhere apart from mid journey. It's insane. Now, Let's talk about what you can do more with this, right? So you click on the advanced option here and you can see there are a bunch of things you can do. So there's performance. You can either focus on speed or quality. There are aspect ratios so you can manipulate the number of images. So you can, let's say I want to generate four images. I'm just going to move the slider to four. Negative prompt. You can add a negative prompt. You don't want it to generate certain items. You can add those here. Maybe NSFW. Now note that because this is an open source model, it will also be generating those kind of images for you. So yeah, just wanted to let you guys know. Then there is an option for styling here. So you can, and this is one of the best things you can do with this model, right? So there is a cinematic such style that is default. You can also do 3D models. So let's say we do this uh, while we review all of this. There is ad based templates, futuristic sci-fi, misc tribal. So all you're doing is just putting a small prompt here and it's, you know, choosing a template in which you want this to generate. And it's kind of taking that all of that into consideration. So all the prompts are baked in the background and it'll do the generation for you. There are more options here where you can choose the LoRa. So for example, if you've trained a model on your face, you can go ahead and choose the LoRa here and generate HD quality images of yourself, right? So that's, I mean, you never really need to do photo shoot ever in your life again. But yeah, I mean, you know, there are a lot of options to choose from here and feel free to kind of play around. But this was probably the most simple tutorial that I've ever made for, and I'm really excited to see where this goes. But as of right now, I'd recommend if you're using any sort of image generation, it's time that you say goodbye and start using this open source uh, framework or model and stay excited for what's going on. And obviously, I'm pretty confident that the folks who are maintaining the repository are obviously going to be working really hard to keep it up to date. So yeah, that's all I'm going to be talking about the video. All the best and have fun generating great images like these. Thank you so much. 
सो मोस्ट ऑफ अस हैव बीन यूजिंग मिड जर्नी और स्टेबल डिफ्यूजन इन ऑर्डर टू क्रिएट ए आई आर्ट और ए आई आवतार्स और एनी ए आई रिलेटेड इमेजेस इन जनरल बट लुक एट दीज इमेजेस दीज इमेजेस फर्स्टली सीम अन रियल एंड डोंट रियली सीम टू बी कनेक्टेड टू अ लॉट ऑफ वॉट वी हैव डन विद स्टेबल डिफ्यूजन पर्सनली और मे बी ऑन मिड जर्नी बट नॉट ऑन स्टेबल डिफ्यूजन पर्सन लुक एट दीज जनरेशन ऑल ऑफ दीज जनरेशन वेर डन ऑन Leonardo AI which is a new AI app or a platform that allows you to use different models and generate super cool imagery like this in this video we're going to be exploring everything that you can do in Leonardo AI so the very first thing you need to know is still in beta so you may uh, want to apply for the waitlist once you get in just have to fill in your username do a very basic sign up journey and this is where you'll land this has a couple of things right the first section is the featured models let's just jump right into it take any image right so if you open this image uh this was generated by this user you can copy the prompt you can do image to image generation you can also add negative prompts or it also kind of talks about um the resolution when it was created the sampler used the base model that was used and then certain related images with this right but the most important part here is the fine tuned model that was used to generate this which is the core capability or the uh one of the most important features of leonardo ai that it allows you to use fine tuned model so this is what i mean when i say fine tuned model right so this specific model was created someone whose name is expect and is great for photorealism and artistic creations so if you click on the model itself you can see uh, there have been 0.4 million images that were generated using the model and then there are certain examples of the images that were generated obviously a lot of these top images that you see here were created using this deliberate 1.1 uh, which is which seems to be one of the most popular model but if you look at leonardo creative here this is an alternative fine tune of sable diffusion 2.1 that brings a little more creativity and interpretation to the mix and looks like voice to be one of the highest used model sites right? so i can see 1.5 million images that were processed using the model so the idea being that there are features if you want to make your image more vintage you go ahead and choose this you want to make it look more cute you can choose this and let's look at some examples you can see that the images that are more cartoonish in nature or maybe fairy tale ish in nature is something that you can generate using luna then there is rpg 4.0 which is good for creating role playing games uh, type of generations per se you can see all of these seem more of fantasy sort of creations right then there is a uh, paper art style illustrations anime you name it right so this is the core capability so there's also pixel art by the way but this is the core capability that leonardo offers you right now is that you can generate art in any style you'd want without actually investing time in order to pre train your model per se now that said let's explore the uh, you know explore certain features of the leonardo platform itself so the first thing we'll be exploring is ai image generation which is one of the core features of leonardo ai again i've you know i've gone ahead and because it takes a lot of time gone ahead and you know predefined certain generations and i'm going to walk you through what the difference between each of the model is right the reason i predid this is because look at this right it's been here for like 85000 seconds now and it's still loading so anyways uh, my first generation was using deliberate 1.1 which is the featured model uh, that allows you to generate better images than stable diffusion one uh, stable diffusion 1.5 or 2.1 and i'm going to prove you why right so this 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 is the same prompt so it says superman and lex is is what it this is what it generates right now the same prompt i put in stable diffusion 2.1 you can see the model here and this is the kind of output i get now this is way better than this uh while this has meaning i can see this uh, specific entity or this person to maybe look as lex i don't see any lex here either way the quality generated here versus the quality generated here it looks like there is a huge difference a crazy amount of difference right now you go step ahead and you choose the leonardo signature which is a different model and these are the results right so you can see for the same query itself this the kind of results right the variations are fine but look at the lighting the face features etc they look way better in this which is deliberate 1.1 compared to the stable diffusion 2.1 and the leonardo signature in leonardo style so i went ahead and tried one more image using the leonardo signature and you can see it's the style itself is retained right the dark uh, contrast of the image is also retained in the image per se so if i were to use this image or I, if i were to use this prompt and 
and generate this using deliberate 1.1 the images or the results would be very different now i went ahead and i also tried um, the image to image so how image to image works is that you click here you select the image that you want to modify in this case i've selected this image again the process is not very different uh, you define the prompt on the top here you select the model and then you go ahead and select the number of samples the guidance scale the step count uh, guidance scale is basically how strongly your prompt is weighed so the more points i think from 20 itself so if you have 20 your output will be more aligned with the what input you put in the lower this the lower it will focus on the prompt that was given by you step count is the number of noise that the image generates before it is rendered so 50 takes a lot of time compared to 30 but 50 also generates better images and also consumes more gpu right either way so uh, this is the image we want to upload now you have things aligned so you say cyborg and i'm going to show you output on how this looks like so you click on generate and it'll start the generation regardless once the generation is complete you'll be able to see something like this right so in this case i entered super villain with deliberate 1.1 model and this is the kind of results it would throw out my input was similar to the fourth image and these are the samples and similarly i put mage here again the hair look different on all you know most of the images but the difference is apparent right so i use the deliberate 1.1 model here as well now here i just went ahead and i use leonardo create a model with just the keyword warrior and this is the kind of output i get uh this is very close to what mid journey does and looks super cool this guy has a superman logo here for no reason but yeah this is the output then i went ahead and you know recently queried a warrior on a disco floor these are the outputs using deliberate 1.1 leonardo style you can see how realistic these look right i in order to kind of show you the example itself a futuristic service app with sleek modern design vibrant neon glow these are the uh, kind of mock-ups that it was able to create from the design standpoint and finally a recent image right where we said cyborg you can see they've created pretty cool uh cyborgish or cyberpunkish images for us to kind of prefer i wouldn't say these are perfect but i wouldn't say these are too bad either right it's a good start man this looks so cool some of these look really weird either ways this is about image to image if you want to just do image to uh, you know text to image you just put the prompt here select the model you want and we kind of walk you through the model itself select negative prompt is necessary and then you generate so you get two for 250 tokens daily and you will every image generation depending on what you know configuration you use you'll consume tokens that's it let's now move on to the prompt generation uh prompt generation is prime you know primarily offers you ways to generate prompt ideas now i just put in cyborg here right what if i wanted to make more detailed prompt on this meaning cyborg in a maybe foreign world so i'll put cyborg foreign world unless you put in detailed prompts you won't be able to kind of generate great images so let's just ideate some prompts using the model and then use these prompts with the same image to see the kind of difference we get in the output it's a futuristic st cyborg stands atop of strange alien landscape surveying horizon a robotic figure strides through the surreal unknown world in a metallic body so you can again click on generate and it'll go to uh, this side of things in order to generate these images again the goal of prompt generation is to primarily get some ideas obviously prompts are way detailed than this and you know there is a whole video on how prompts work so if you're interested in learning about prompt engineering feel free to kind of check that video out regardless you can see the process has started similarly an image will be generated which can then be used uh, to generate either more samples or just use this as you please right so now you click on this image you can see the original image you can also kind of edit it in canvas you can upscale it so right now the quality of the image is uh, not too well you can upscale for a better quality you can remove background if I click here, it'll remove the background. You can unzoom zoom image. You can download the image. You can delete the image. So you can see the prompt has been applied here, and the you know results are a bit different than what we had generated earlier. But yeah, I think you get the point. So let's now move on to the uh, the AI canvas. What this basically is is a similar version to what OpenAI's DALI offers right now, right? So you have a uh, you know playground of sorts where you upload the image and you can then create unlimited images or then just mask certain parts of the images in order to do such generations. On the right side here, you can choose which model to use. You can choose 4.1 or 2.1. Choose a number of generation. You can choose the dimensions that you want to generate image in. 
guidance skill, which is uh, how strongly your prom prompt is weighted against the machine itself, so something you can select. Then there is step count, uh, you know, the higher the step count, meaning it will go through more noise in order to generate the final image. Now for this specific case, let's try and upload an image using this image. Um, effectively, what I'm now going to do, there are a bunch of things, right? So there is a draw mask feature where you can draw a mask somewhere on the image, which is also the inpainting side of things that you can find on Stable Diffusion. And you can make custom modifications on what you want to do in that specific region of the image. So let me just quickly mask this. You can increase the brush size in order to improve the speed of masking. Mask the image. Now the next step here is you'll type a prompt or so I'm saying make me look like Navi from Avatar movie. The generations uh, from what I've noticed usually take time but let's try this one. So this is the image that is generated. Obviously this is <laughs> obviously this is not perfect but you can see that it's tried oh man honestly it looks terrible but again it's kind of tried its best to bring in the features of Avatar. I can see eyes are red, the image has a bluish texture, the lips have aligned, etc. Et now let's try on one more image and on this specific image, we'll try to give some other prompt. Let me quickly draw a mask. All right, so this is the mask area. What I want the model to do is see the kind of results we get. So this is the kind of you know output that I get in the model itself. Again, this isn't the um, best output in the world, but you get the idea you know about what the model can do for you. I think it's made me look a little more younger. And if I had selected more than one images, I'd be able to toggle between these images. Either ways, at this point, um, what you can do in Leonardo AI. Yeah. And yeah, I think that's pretty much all I wanted to kind of talk about in this video itself. There are more features that will go live uh, and I'll be more, you know, I'll be actively talking about those features as and when they do go live. So if you like this video, consider uh, subscribing to the channel, drop a like on this video, share this across with a friend and I'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you so much. Trust me, all of these prompts are generated with GPT-4. I trained the model to understand what is Midjourney and the kind of prompts that Midjourney can create. So in this video, I'm going to walk you through how you can use GPT-4 to generate prompts like these. Note that GPT-3 is not great with respect to this. So I trained the GPT-3 model and these are the kind of results I get. While these are okay as a starting point, GPT-4 is way more accurate when it comes to generating precise Midjourney prompts. So in order to get started, there are three steps that you need to do, right? So the first step is to tell the model about basic prompting, right? So I'm going to say as an image GPT, you'll serve as an AI art prompting assistant for the well-known text to image tool, Midjourney. And then you give, some, give it some more context and then you tell it what prompts are. What are basic prompts, advanced prompt, image prompt, text prompt, prompt text parameters, uh, notes about the prompts, what is grammar in prompts, what is the subject, medium, environment, lighting. Then you talk about basic parameters, chaos, quality seed, everything. And all of this is available on the Midjourney uh, website. So I've just kind of gave the model all the details that it needs to know in order to start building these prompts. And finally, I told if it understood all of this, just say got it. So it went ahead and did that. Next, now that, ha now that it has the guide to generate these prompts, we need to tell the model we need to give models some examples for it to kind of internalize certain structure with respect to this, right? So I've given like 10, 10 odd examples from the Midjourney uh, Discord channels and kind of trained it for these use cases. And you can go ahead and train it for your specific use cases. Then I ask if it understood how Midjourney prompts would prompts work, right? So it kind of confirmed that it understood and it kind of gave some details with respect to how it can generate these prompts. Finally, I uh, post the training was done. I told it to generate 20 Midjourney prompts across different categories like people, space, imagination, food, travel, anything you can possibly think of. So it went ahead and created really great prompts and I'm going to try it in Midjourney to show how some of these look. But it generated 20 and then at this point, you can generate any amount of prompts you want using Midjourney. You can give it some content by saying that okay maybe generate space prompts or maybe generate animal prompts and now that it knows how Midjourney prompting works it will generate prompts in order to suit what you need to generate. So let's try this prompt in Midjourney and see the kind of output we get. While I head to Discord just a quick request if you're new to this channel firstly consider subscribing to the channel for the best content in generative AI. Second if you're interested to stay ahead in generative AI follow me on Twitter and join our Discord channel. Yeah that mind let's query our first prompt. So this is the output for our first prompt. 
we had basically told it to generate a magical photolight with bioluminescent mushrooms ethereal floating orbs of light and mythical creatures and done a decent job with this right so you can see uh, glowing mushrooms footpath etc i've also put in the second prompt to see the kind of output we get the second prompt we said detailed illustration of steampunk inspired mechanical dragon this one looks great too What's great about training your model or training your GPT-4 for your own use cases is that now that the model understand how it works, you can actually go ahead and do creative things like telling it to write stories, right? So I've told 10 mid-journey prompts on a short story such that if images seen one after the other seems logically a uh, moving story, give it a title and then give 10 mid-journey prompts. Kind of went ahead and gave a title of the story, went ahead and generated 10 prompts that if you would look, obviously the, these may need more refinements. So what I've noticed that when I run this and, and the results to this, um, are available in my previous video on Stable Diffusion XL versus Midjourney V5. What I noticed is that the protagonist kept changing, which kind of changed the alignment of the overall prompt. So if instead of a young adventurer, you could feed in a more detailed prompt, like say a person with red hair or a person with gray hair, wearing white trousers, etc., etc. right? So all of that will make it more centered and you can, you can tell GPT-4 in order to keep those details in mind. So maintain the integrity of all the prompts. All of that is possible once you have this trained. This is like your own bot to generate prompts after this, right? You can obviously keep feeding more prompts. So at some point, so at some point, I also fed more prompts to the model saying that, okay, these are some more prompts for you to kind of internalize how all of this works. And after this, the prompting got more uh, detailed. So all of this you can keep in mind. Um, and like once you do the proper training of the model, it will generate great prompts for your output. Now note that the memory is transient, meaning that after some time, you may have to retrain the model to give it context. It may forget things after a specific point of time. But I think this is a great guide, especially for shorter run projects where you want to train images on a specific set of samples. You can use this to achieve that, right? Consider subscribing to the channel. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye. Hey guys, welcome to this channel. I'm gonna show you how to generate 100 short YouTube videos, Instagram Reels or TikTok, only using AI in an hour. And it only requires you to do copy and paste, which takes you 10 seconds for every short video. So we're gonna be using ChatGPT to generate ideas, maybe fictional ideas that are around AI stories, educational content and so on. And then we'll use Snappy AI to generate the shorts. So Snappy AI generates really good shorts. And I'm gonna show you an example of a short that I generated. It did pretty well on YouTube. So I'm just gonna show it to you in a second. All right, so this is the short. I'm not obviously going to be running through the entire shot but let, let's just quickly take a look at the preview of what it generated from this prompt so you can see it's literally just this much and it generated something like this what if there was a hidden world beneath our feet our feline friend investigates something out of the ordinary it discovers a parallel universe it's a really good tool now we're going to be feeding this prompt in chat gpt to generate 50 topic ideas now if you post one shot every day that means you have content for next 50 days now which is which is crazy right so this is the prompt we'll feed and obviously you can reuse the prompt to generate another set of 50 ideas or maybe you can just change the category now what we will be focusing on let me just walk you through the prompt so i'll just give some details with respect to what goes viral and stories can be around what and how long are the shorts and then what things we need ai to give us and then what format we need this these in right so and the category we want to take is fictional ai stories that people want to learn about let's say what happens when you land on moon for the first time without a spacesuit just fictional just fictional stories that we'd want to generate right so once you feed this prompt in chat gpt gpt will get to work with this you know it will take you know take a look at these details i'm using gpt4 but if you have gpt 3.5 feel free to kind of use that as well it's now generating some python script because i'm using the code interpreter which typically would first write a uh, code and then give you the final output so let's just quickly take a look at some of the ideas swimming in an ocean of jelly spark imagination jellyfish have been around over 500 million years so that's some extra knowledge what if we what if trees gave free wi-fi which is really interesting stir soci societal reflection trees produce oxygen vital for human survival and we'll go ahead and generate some very cool fictional ideas for you which you can then use and feed to snappy ai to generate content for yourself now it stopped at around i think 10 ideas we'll just generate we'll just tell it to generate 50 ideas in a tabular format so it's now generating a list of 50 ideas which is going to take the first one here first date with an alien and we're going to be feeding that to snappy ai why are we generating this we are exploring cross uh, species communication 
and some extra details that 100 billion planets in our galaxy may post life. I'm just gonna add my handle name here in order to ensure that you know I have this kind of watermark on the image. And for voice, you can go ahead and select whichever you'd like. Thank you for I using like Snappy. This one, so I'm gonna keep that one. For caption style, we will be choosing the second one. And you can just go ahead and click on generate content. It takes approximately three to four minutes to generate the whole shot for you. So let, let me just wait for it to generate and then I'll walk you through how it works. It does not really take the entire five minutes. All right, so it kind of took me around three minutes to generate this video and here we go. You know, this was the prompt that we had added. All right, let's just quickly watch the generation now. It's around 25 seconds and you can see there's a watermark with my name here. So let's just play this. What if you went on a date with an alien? They traveled billions of light years to meet you. Their language may be different, but love has no borders. Together, exploring the mysteries of the universe, finding joy in the differences that connect us. Distance may separate us, but a bond can transcend gap. Yeah, I think this looks pretty cool. The images look great as well. The content is great. Me to cherish. There what do you think about this face, extraordinary um, encounter? And it ends with a question, which is what a lot of shots do. So now imagine that this was just one of the shots, right? Now there are around 50 ideas here. If you were to take each idea, feed this here, within a matter of three seconds, you'd have content that you'd want to paste on a specific day, which is insane. You can basically start a channel with hypothetical AI ideas like these, and people love this sort of content. And it took me around five credits to generate the shot, and you get around i think some starting credits when you start on the platform so really really cool guys like if you're considering starting a faceless youtube channel maybe you just want to advertise your products more for example you want to create advertisement for your brand they also have this option to add your brand name you can basically add either your handle or website url here and you can generate social media communication or advertisement for your product every day so really really cool i am really excited to try try this out more you've been noticing i've been posting some shots on these lines on my channel and they're getting around 100, 200 views which is not so bad with some likes right which is similar to or maybe better than what i get on my other shorts content so consider trying this tool out and if you have any questions feel free to kind of get in touch with me in the comments thank you so much guys and have a good day. Hey guys in this video i'm going to show you how i generated this complete video using only ai in a world transformed by technology robots were once introduced as helpers trained meticulously in factories designed to improve efficiency soon they were everywhere in offices, restaurants, construction sites. Astonishingly skilled and precise, they even outperformed humans in sports, arts, and intellectual challenges like chess. However, the rise of AI wasn't smooth. There were hiccups, chaos, as some robots disrupted daily life. But the robotic police took control, maintaining order with unyielding grip. Slowly, the dynamics shifted. Helpers turned overseers, supervising us in all aspects. We sacrificed our freedom for efficient. Today, we coexist with our creations in a world they've shaped. As a human and a robot sit watching the sunset, we're left to ponder the future. In the all right, so I did this using three tools. Number one was obviously ChatGPT and specifically GPT-4. Second one was Runway for videos. And finally, for audio, I used 11 Labs. And I'm going to show you and break down the process of how I did this step by step, right? So initially, I wanted to generate a Apple Vision Pro trailer using um, trailer using Gen 2. But then eventually, when I actually started generating content and generating videos for the scenes, I realized that to make Runway aware about how Apple Vision Pro looks like at this point was a pretty big deal and it wouldn't give out the results that were necessary. So rather I changed tracks. So rather I changed tracks and I told old GPT to generate a 50 second script on AI Takeover. Each video scene will be five seconds and each scene in the script should be followed with a prompt for Gen 2, right? So I gave it a structure scene and prompt and then it was able to generate actual 10 scene story for me with a prompt that I could give to Gen 2. Then I made some customization with respect to what I wanted to see in the scenes. And I also told it to make these scenes a lot more detailed because when I was trying to take these prompts and add it in Gen 2, they weren't giving they weren't really giving accurate results, right? So I told it to detail out prompts further and it went ahead and did that. So once I was able to generate prompts here, effectively what I did is I copied these prompts and I went to Gen 2 and I generated the videos for these prompts. So you can see these are the videos that were generated and it's pretty simple how you do this, right? In order to generate videos, just go to generate videos, click Gen 2 and then you add your prompt here and we're able to generate a video for you like this, right? So it's pretty straightforward. I was able to generate 
all the scenes for the video here, uh, specifically 10 scenes. And for the scenes that I wasn't convinced, you can see there are 17 videos that I had generated here. So these are, so some of these videos weren't really up to the mark. I either discarded them or used them as fillers uh, in the final video that I had made, right? You can see this video I did not even use in the video, right? So because this was merely some text floating on the screen. And you see, this, was, this is how I was able to generate every video. Now, Gen 2 will typically generate four second videos and they will not be interconnected, right? So what you need to ensure is that the prompts that you put are actually interconnected with each other. So the scenes are all, if you look at these scenes, right? They are somehow relevant to the previous and the next scenes. So you need to ensure that the prompts that you're putting in order to build a story are related to each other. Now, once I had the story done, right? Once I was... Also, yes, you need to keep it below 320 characters for the prompt to work. Once I was able to generate the entire story uh, or generate all set of videos, I told it to write a 60 seconds audio script for the video, right? So in this specific case, uh, it was able to write this script. And then I went into 11 labs and 11 labs does give you around 10,000 um, characters for free every month. So it's a great, and I think it's one of the best tools in the market to currently do any text to audio or speech, speech synthesis. So I went to 11 labs and here I was able to paste the content here. I was able to generate audio for that content. So, so in very simple terms, I took the script here and I added it here. I selected, I added it here and I selected the audio that I wanted. So I heard a couple of these audios. You can see, you can demo them here. Not see, what we have, but what we played enjoy out here. constitutes I chose audience. the most appropriate audio for the video. And then I added the text here and then I generated it. So once the generation is done, it's as simple as just downloading it, right? Now, once you have all of these things, so once you have the audio and video in place, now all you need to do is either go to Canva and put your scenes here and put your audio here and just let it play because, you know, the scenes are connected and so is the audio. I specifically use Premiere Pro because I use it for my editing needs. And this part is pretty simple because all you need to do is drag and drop your videos here. Let's say these are my videos. I to align these one after the other. So this is how I probably would align my videos and then drag the audio in the scene as well. Let's say this is the audio we wanted to drag. So you drag it like this. And this is pretty much how the, this is pretty much how I created the entire video merely by using AI. You can see the only components I was really investing any time on was putting these clips together. But otherwise the script, the text and the audio, everything was generated using AI. And I'm hoping you can give this a shot too. Gen2 gives you some free credits. I think it gives you around 70 seconds worth of free video that you can generate. So do go around and play with the model if you want. You can go ahead and subscribe to Gen2 if you'd like the product and any of these tools that I just showcased here. But I hope this video was able to add value to you guys. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Hey guys, so it's been some time since I last uploaded a video. It's, you can see it's been three weeks and I apologize for it. Over this time, I've been working on building an AI video editor and let me walk you through that over the video itself. So the tool as of right now is called Video Silence Remover because I wanted to focus on one niche that is removing the silent parts of the video, right? If you go through the website, you'll find that all of this is very, very new. As a content creator or someone who creates YouTube videos a lot, there are sections in the videos where you don't talk. Maybe you're reading the script or maybe you're just re-recording something. Maybe you're thinking about something. Maybe you're showing something or maybe navigating to some other page. And all of that editing takes a lot of time in the background. So while I'm talking to you here, over this video, I'll go through different screens and there will be blank spaces where there will not be any sound in the video itself. But when I have to edit this post, the recording itself, individually cutting those parts take a, takes a lot of time, which is why I created Video Silence Remover and I have bigger plans for it. But as of right now, let's just look at what it does and how it works. So in order to use it, just go to the videosilencemover.com and go ahead and click on try for free. It's currently free, so you don't really have to worry about putting your credit card details or worry about paying anything. You should hopefully be able to land on the dashboard like this, where you'll have an option to select video silence. Now, while it's called video silence remover, it's way more than just that. And let me explain you why. Firstly, it will definitely go ahead and cut those silent parts. For you. Second, it also kind of optimizes the file size such that the quality is retained but the file size is comparatively smaller than what than what the original file size was. 
All right, so once you land here, all you need to do is select the video. I'm also gonna be showing you a demo video to demonstrate how it works. So I'm uploading a two minute video that I had recorded for one of my shots. It'll just take a few seconds before it's ready. So let's take a look at this sample video that's kind of two minutes and two seconds long. And let's focus on one of the sections of the video. So, so we're gonna be starting from the sixth second in the video and listen to the video now. Note that Google Bar just added an upload feature on the website where you can now upload images and ask question about those images. What this so you can see over the 12 second period odd, I had two pauses where I had to think or maybe change certain screens before I move forward with the video itself. And there are pauses right now while I'm recording this. And then in the background, when I'm editing the video, I have to look through each of these silent parts and make the cuts in Premiere Pro before I, before I do next set of edits on the video. And this is important from the perspective of user retention. So if there are so many pauses throughout the video, it's highly likely that you will not continue to watch the video because it just leaves bad experience or bad taste for you as a user. All right, so let's go back to video silence remover. Now I've uploaded the file here and you have a couple of options. So you can do the one that works well. You can do heavy cuts where your background noise is low and you can do light cuts where you have higher background. Noise. Just gonna choose the default one because it works. And you just click on the process file. It takes a few seconds, but you can see the file processing has started. What What is happening now is that it's kind of using AI to identify these it's now using AI to identify these gaps or silent parts of the video and automatically editing the video in order for you to, and then automatically kind of editing the video for you, or at least doing the first cut editing for the, for your videos. It typically takes around one minute to do the uh, entire processing. So let's, so let me just refresh the video here. You can see it's already ready in a couple of seconds. You, all you need to do is just refresh for it to show up on your screen. So this was the file that I had up. I reviewed the result. It's not edited very well. And that's primarily because firstly, it's still in beta. Second, you have the options to kind of you know, choose different options or maybe just specifically or maybe just manually specify what options you want to edit the video with. and this is primarily because the silence threshold can be different for different scenarios so i'd encourage you play around those values as well if you don't get the desired result so i'm just going to click on the process file again the process is same it's going to be starting a process here again and you'll also get notified via email once it's ready i'm going to refresh it you can see it's loading the file now all right so the new video file is here you can see the initial video file was around 2 minutes and 12 seconds but the edited one by using the video silence remover it's 1 minute and seconds now let's play this so if you're unable to use gpt4's upload feature for whatever reason note that google bar just added a new upload functionality note that google bar just added an upload feature on the website where you can now upload images and ask question about those images you can see all the silent parts that existed in the previous videos have automatically been trimmed throughout the video now this process took Took the app around five minutes to do but if i had to do this manually on this two minute video it would have easily taken me 10 to 15 minutes and now all i have to do is you know some of the parts that are repeated throughout the video i have to make cuts for those parts and that's mostly going to be especially for content creators focused on releasing videos every day that's most likely going to be all the editing that we would probably want to do in the video to make it interesting for you guys so i'd encourage you to go ahead and try out the platform itself you can see that if you're files don't come out as expected you can you can try different settings here in my case light cuts did, did really well because it's optimized to my background once you find the setting that works for you for your future videos because the setting of your studio will not necessarily change feel free to use that same setting for the subsequent videos and that is pretty much going to be it for the video guys again i'm really sorry for not being able to upload videos for the past few weeks but i promise i'm going to be way more consistent now and i'd appreciate if you could give me feedback on this tool it will help me improve this over time that's going to be it for the video guys thank you so much hey guys welcome in this video i'm going to be quickly walking you through what open interpreter is a lot of people mentioned that this is like the gpt 4.5 version and in the most simplest of terms it basically means that it can already do what a lot of gpt 4 can do but it also can do things beyond gpt 4 and it was released by killian so i'm just going to go to the github page now and i'm going to firstly just quickly take a look at this right so it can create and edit photos videos pdfs etc control a chrome browser to perform research it can plot clean and analyze large data sets it's insane so it 
it can definitely you know look through the files in your computer and then perform operations on these files now the only concern that i have is the amount of things that i'm sharing with this while it's open source sure do i really want a stranger in that sense to access my documents i know it's a code running somewhere in the cloud right but you are can I still using your computer to send some data there and then process it in the cloud. So what I'm going to do is I'm I'm going to try it in my PC anyways. And over this demo, I'd want you to think that is this something that you would really want to do. There are two ways you can run this model, right? So the first method is using your GPT-4 API key. The second method is using the open source Llama model. For the first method, it's pretty straightforward. You just need the key and it works. So the second method, you will need to download Llama, which the interface will automatically do. So you don't need to worry about the third Third thing, and I think this is the pro probably the most important thing, is you'll need Python installation. So in order to download Python, you need to go to python.org slash downloads and you can download Python from here. And just, I think it's a pretty straightforward setup, but ensure that there's an option to kind of add Python to your path. You enable that while you're installing Python in your system. So if you already have it installed, you don't even need to worry about it. I think you're all set up. All right, so the overview of what it is is clear. Now let's just quickly start running this in our local system so in order to run this it's like a library for python right so it, you need to do pip install open interpreter and the reason i'm even trying this out in the first place if you look at the stars here on github it's almost 14k stars which means that a lot of people do trust this so i'm just gonna go by my gut and the amount of stars there to see if it uh, works so i'm gonna copy this you need to open your terminal or command line so if you're on windows just do windows and r and type cmd this will open the command prompt for you if you're on mac just find terminal one thing to be and i'm just gonna run this here so you need to run pip install open interpreter this will only work if you have python installed in your computer if you don't have python this will fail next you need to type interpreter to make this run now, this is where I kind of want to talk about more with respect to the highlights, right? So if you use OpenAI API key, firstly, I'd never recommend you share your API key anywhere. Now, it's possible that it's just using your local key and not sharing it in the cloud, but it's very unlikely because it's accept accepting your key and is definitely sending it somewhere for uh, the further processing. So if you are using this to test this in your local system, just to ensure that you use it once and then you delete your key from OpenAI ecosystem. The second note on code Llama is that Llama is maybe not supported in Windows as far as uh, my testing goes. So I tried it running it using code Llama, but it, it just gave me an error saying that, that it's not supported in my system, specifically Windows one, I guess. So we're just gonna go with open AI API key for now. I have a sample API key. You can go ahead and copy it. I'm just gonna delete it later on. Okay, so the key is set and it's telling you how to set it on your export. But either ways, I think it's definitely sending key over some sort of cloud. I'm definitely gonna delete it as soon as I'm done with this. All right, so I think the interpreter is set. Let me just go to GitHub and see what kind of things we can do. All right, so it's kind of talking about how it's better than the ChatGPT's code interpreter because of the limitations it's bypassing right now. So I just went ahead and tried typing, hi, what, what can you do? Okay. So it's telling me it can do a bunch of things, writing, running, debugging code, installation, automating tasks, web scraping and interactivity. The interesting part is automating tasks in your computer. So let's see if we can make it clean my desktop. Right, let's say, I, let's see what it does. Oh, interesting. So it's creating a new file in slash desktop slash desktop, desktop cleanup. Let's see, I'm just gonna see if it works. All right, so I had to authorize moving these files. It's checking if I can... Okay, let's see if my desktop is cleaned. Well, it's more... I don't think so. Nope, it didn't clean my desktop. So you can see there's an error here. All right, so that didn't work. So let's see if it's able to access my Google Chrome. Hmm. Yeah, so it definitely can't access Google Chrome. Let's see if it can open it. Okay, so it's using shell command to start. Oh, it worked. Didn't see that coming. So it can definitely execute some commands for sure. So you can see it did open the Chrome window. Then you open Chrome and go to snappy.ai let's see if it can open chrome window and go to a website all right some authorizing you can see it's yeah it's going to the website too so that's cool and that's pretty cool okay let's see what what else can we do so it can't access your desktop but it can run your shell file let's say can you write a code for a basic snake game create project folder on the desktop 
So one of the assumptions that I am making right now at this point is that it does not have access to my, you know, to, you know, make changes to my computer. It's something I'd want to ensure that I don't give because I don't know the amount of control. I While I know it has good amount of stars on GitHub, I still wouldn't want to risk giving access to my, I don't know if it's reversible. If it was offline, maybe I, maybe I'd have done that or maybe not. Okay, so it's writing code for the game. I'm checking if there is a folder on the desktop. Mm, no, I don't see it. So it says it's created a folder under C users admin sneak game. Okay, let's see what happens. Okay, so it's rewriting the code. And the other thing that you need to keep in mind when running this is all of these iterations, especially if you're using GPT-4 API key, they're costing you money. So by the time you, you know, decide to shut it down, if it's gone through multiple iterations, it's going to cost you a hell of a amount of money. So ensure that you have, keep it, keep a eye out on the operations that it's doing so you don't end up spending too much money. So it's, yeah, it's writing code or game. Okay, so let's see if it saves now. Still didn't work. It's very similar to what Code Interpreter offers, only the fact that it's running in your local system with mostly what you would anyways do on Code Interpreter. So I'm just going to stop it here. We get the point. Let's say, and by the way, to stop it, if you're on Windows, just do Control C, it'll stop. I think on Mac also, it's Control C, it'll stop for if you if you press both of these keys subsequently. Anyways, I'm going to stop this and let's see what else we can do. All right, so I'm seeing if you can send an email to yash at snappy.ai for an affiliate program at snappy.ai. Let's see if that works. Okay, of course it does require you to set up a sim. So it's referring to the less secure apps in Gmail settings, which I think is deprecated now. All right, so let me do one more thing. I have some images inside this folder test and these are PNG images. Let's see if it can convert these images into JPG. So more on the lines of so more on the lines of say file conversion. Let's see if that that is possible. All right, so I'm telling it to convert the folder. So the images under the folder test into JPG while they're currently as stored as PNG. Let's see if that's possible. All right, so it's installing pillow in my local system. Right, let's see. So the initial one, this one is used when you're running it on say Google Colab. If you're running it on local system, you need this command, which is why it worked the second time around. Now it's actually going inside the test folder to see if it can find images and then manipulate it to convert into the JPG. And you'll see that it's kind of involved, installed pip installed pillow in your local system. So it's not going to be removing it. So when you're using this, this is yet another risk that it'll install libraries and then you it will not remove it so it's on you to kind of remove those data so be careful with it. and i can see that saying that it successfully converted these images but 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 i don't think so right so these are still you can see the folder is users admin desktop test users admin desktop test did find file names ending with png but didn't, didn't save those as jpg so let's say I, if i say it's it's not done see if it can uh, have a follow-up going on. Let's see if it can uh, try to do another attempt. All right, so this time around, I think it worked. Yeah, this time around it was able to do that. You see, this is a JPG file. Let's see what different, okay. yeah, I think this time it worked. I don't know why, but it did work this time. All right, and I think that's, now I went through a bunch of different commands across different categories. And to be honest, it does work great when you want to do file operations in your local system when you want to do operations that are specific to say your shell, let's say if you can open a specific file, do some research, etc. But it's always going to be installing open source Python libraries to do certain bits. So be careful when you're using this. Uh, would I use it in my local system? At this point, no, because it's very risky to have this running because I don't know what uh, kind of files it'll download and I do, it's not like the app is bad. The fact that it's using GPT-4 in the background, and I've noticed that some of the output that GPT-4 throws out, it, it's not suitable for your use case, right? And if you install this, it's gonna throw in a bunch of different libraries. And if you don't remove those later, libraries are basically installs. You saw one of the pip install, right? If you don't remove those later, they're gonna be problematic. So I'm a bit skeptical to try this out right now, but maybe definitely once, you know, I feel that it's using something uh, like a Llama 2, maybe if it works in my local system or windows system then maybe yes but at this point not really all right 
Hey guys, Canva released a bunch of generative AI features very recently and I'm going to try these out. In order to access features, all you need to do is scroll a bit and you'll be able to find all of them here. You can obviously find it inside the editor, but to show you uh, the features, I'm going to quickly open these items here. So first is magic right everywhere, play with draw. Not all of these are generative AI features, there is try out ma magic design, try out magic edit and eraser, try out magic presentation, edit with beeps. So there's animation, brand hub, trans Translate and finally tech. Let's quickly try each one of them and see what they do. Now the, the first one is Magic Write. It's an AI about writing as a start your brainstorm idea. Quickly generate writing. Is this like a notion AI? Um, let's just try it. So I'm opening this in a new tab here. And best to start five topics on basic search. So in order to try it out, you get 25 magic rights, especially when it comes to magic rights. I'm not sure about the other ones yet. But let's start something, five topics on basics of generative. So it went ahead and it kind of added AI generated text. You see what this can do for your presentation, right? So assume that you're making presentations on uh, Canva. You can use this feature in order to generate AI powered text for you while you're building the presentation. Now, I don't know if there is a, is there a way to magic, right? So all you need to do is put hash and then start like 500 character basics of generative so 500 character basics of generative AI. now these are more appropriate especially when you want to make your presentation imagine how quickly you can make presentations now using let's quickly try the new one draw i'm not sure if this is an ai or hand drawn it looks like this is basic paintbrush where you can drag and draw new ideas so i'm not going to explore this one it's just magic design put your media there and it builds a bunch of designs so let's try it i'm gonna upload my own image and see what can be done on this so i've uploaded my image basically what the feature would do is it would create variations and you will see what i mean here right so it kind of this is like a testimonial this is like a gaming um card or something like an instagram page you can obviously customize this template further seems more like a, a banner with photo Overall, well, this is a good feature like i think you can re use these real time uh, but again this is new and improving so certain uh alignment or thing uh, things that have aligned here may not be perfect basically all it's doing it's kind of uh, identifying what the character is and then putting them in the appropriate situation. Let's quickly try this one. We tried the magic design. So designs the photo, right? Now this is the magic edit and erase these objects from your photos. Okay, how do I use it? It's like this is also something that's new. I don't really know how to use the magic eraser. It will not use edit photo and then magic edit. Yeah, it requires a premium version. We are very uh, terrible in that. It's like I can't even figure out how to use it. Let's try magic presentation. So this is one of the features that I really like where you can uh, request Canva to build a presentation for you merely based on text and it generates like a template that you can use. Maybe it's using generative AI, right? So let's say basics of generative AI. So it takes a few seconds to create the presentation. But then once it's done, it kind of uh, builds a bunch of samples. And each of these samples will subsequently have slide, right? So, and the best part is that these are generated by AI. The text itself is generated by AI. And so these are all things that are relevant uh, to the presentation. So these, this is not dummy data. This is real data that you can use after doing some basic edits on the. At this point, some of these are not good looking, but I think it's a great direction to move. Uh, because there are not a lot of tools that currently build present. I think this is one of the good features that Canva has I may be able to use it. Then there is Beat Sync. What this basically does is it kind of understands the beat points of the video and then aligns the video accordingly. So let's check. You call me a saint but you know I'm a stranger or willing so you can see these are beat points it, when it knows that this is a beat point so it'll skip to the most relevant video frame yeah so i don't make a lot of videos on canva or edit a lot of videos on canva if you're one of those people who do that i think this may be the thing you may be looking for. then there is animation to so fly the bee from flower to control the speed of your animation by moving it. i intentionally did that but you can see it's kind of recording the action of the mouse and kind of creating like a flow for me going to the next uh kick the ball into the goal maybe i have to add an animation yeah so in order to do it you just have to 
click on animation see there's a animate option here now once you do that you can kind of do this yeah i think yeah there you go so uh, again not not too bad this is one of the good features to use uh from my standpoint i'm definitely gonna give it a, it'll really help right now there's brand hub i don't know what that is that i'm brands all in grid oh so this is not uh i think this is not generative where this is a basic feature that canva has released as a part of their major uh so i'm not going to take a look at that but i'm going to quickly explore the generative ai features so this one says translates automatically detected this is let's see if it also translate text in bengali and then apply to this. yeah it was able to translate everything and it looks really great so it didn't really uh, delete that old slide it created a new version with the edition so imagine if you are someone who's making presentation in um, one language and you want to show the same presentation in some other language it's something you can uh, take i may personally be able to use it for one of the use cases that i just thought and finally this is a uh, text to image i think if you're following generative ai this may be a no brainer for you at the hey, dog on a subway and i'm going to say drink. like all the ai generation features my assumption is this would also take some time so let's see yeah two dogs are already ready there's a third one and here's the final really cool you can regenerate or start over you can also do some other style and create again but otherwise i think this is a great feature if you liked um or if you're following generative ai feel free to kind of join our discord but this is going to be it for the video if you have questions for any question just drop it see you guys hey guys there were two major changes made to runway after the initial release itself The first one was that generate up to five seconds of video and at a higher resolution and at twenty five frames per second. So I'm just gonna quickly try this new update. So all you have to do is select the file. For this, I'm gonna take one of my own videos. I wanna see the kind of results it generates. Initially, it was crashing a lot uh, on the production, but now I think it's working fine. The video is uploaded, right? I'm basically just waving my hands around in the video to see how it looks. I'm gonna choose one of the demo images here. This claymation paper again. Let's say claymation and see how it looks. Takes a few seconds to generate your video. You can see now I came from 22 seconds to 17 seconds. So I'm gonna wait until this is done. By the way, if you're interested in, by the way, if you're interested in new tools in generative AI or just want to follow what's happening in generative AI, join our Discord channel. The link is in the description. Anywho, the video is now ready. Let's just quickly take a look. Wow, it's done a fantastic job in my opinion. It's done five seconds. We'll look at this. Yeah, so all of these moments come after five seconds, which is why it's not. Let's try one more video. Let's try generating one more of this. Right, this time we will try prompt. In other words, of the space planets in the background. Let's try. It. You can create more variations of the video. Run it. Also, uh, do pen and ink. You can see how it can process multiple of these. See how it can process multiple of these at the same time. Also going to do cyberpunk. So compared to earlier, the video is better quality for sure, and also is longer. So the updates I think have really really helped. I only have two seconds worth of videos left now, so I'm not going to do any more. I don't know if these credits are renewed every month. So there is no indication if these are. So you may just have to upgrade if you're looking to use more of Gen One after you exhaust the free ones. So you will be billed fifteen per month. With six twenty-five credits, and I think it costs fourteen credits per video. I think you can do approximately forty-four. You can do approximately forty-four video generations with the standard plan, hundred and sixty video generations with the pro plan as of right now. Okay, so this is the output for the prompt one. Hmm, not bad. Looks like some creature from the nether world with the space background. Something that we uh, wanted to generate. Next, I think I tried the pen and ink. And I don't think it's bad at all. It's a great generation work. And finally, we tried the cyberpunk one. Yeah, this one's not too good because it's assuming that it's putting city on my face. So this one is not too good. But yeah, but I think you understand now. So I hope this video helps, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you. So this is the output. Previous model wouldn't be able to pull this off. Say this is not bad. Yeah, this is way better than the previous ones. What's up, guys? In this video, I'm going to be looking at Stable Diffusion XL, which was announced two days back, which is like an upgrade to Stable Diffusion 2.1, and it's great at creating detailed images, hyper-realistic images, images like these, and especially text.
which has been an issue with a lot of text to image generation model it's currently in beta and available on dream studio and it will be released as an open source model in the near future remember the sta- previous two stable diffusion models were also open source what i mean by that is that you can download this model in your local system and play around with it without really paying any charges to use the model per se some highlights right the photorealism image composition face generation shorter prompts to create descriptive imagery greater capability to produce legible text rich visuals and jaw dropping aesthetics you can go ahead and read it out if you want what we're going to be doing in this video is we're going to be trying this model and comparing it with midjourney v5 i have i have a list of six prompts that i'll run basically these six prompts are kind of a logical story of an adventurer i'm going to be running this across both stable diffusion excel and the midjourney v5 in order to access stable diffusion you have to go to dream studio which is like a platform where you can run all this uh you'll have some i think 25 credits to use the model and you'll have to choose stable diffusion excel which is in beta right now you can choose the style if you want right so there's anime enhance comic book um i'm just going to go with x enhance at this point and these are all generic things right so i'm assuming you know you know all of this right so this is the prompt where you will tell what you want to generate next is negative prompt where you tell things that you don't want in the image right so there's a uh, blurry images or broken limbs broken arms all of those things you have to tell model to not have so it will do like a check to ensure that these things are not uh, included as a part of the output i'm going to compare this again with midjourney v5 output to see the kind of results we get so let's get started let's run the first one right i'm going to run the same in midjourney v5 also since we are on discord uh, we have a community for generative ai enthusiasts on discord uh, where we answer all the new questions and share the learnings happening in generative ai right so uh, if you are interested feel free to kind of join this channel it will kind of help you up your game with respect to generative ai in general so it started the generation right i'm going to wait for some time just a quick heads up right uh, the last time i compared stable diffusion 2.1 versus midjourney versus leonardo which is yet another tool to generate text to images mid journey and leonardo came neck to neck but stable diffusion did perform very bad right so it had two points from a total of 10 points that we had compared or 10 images that we did, we had compared on the platform the cab our story was that an adventurer discovers a map then he kind of embarks on that journey he then finds an ancient sea creature in the depths offering guidance and wisdom to the adventurer then he arrives on a hidden island where he finds a magical forest he then finds a hidden vault within a ch- some hidden chamber or a temple and then he comes back and sharing the tale of enchanted voyage with his friends and families gathered around a cozy fireplace so we'll go through one by one right so this is the image for the first result where he found the map before he embarked on the journey honestly like it seems more cartoonish in nature um we look at the mid journey generation it looks way more realistic right so especially this one and this one for some reason there are two people here generation and the realism of the generation is way better for mid journey at least at this point of time so next you um the adventurer kind of takes forward and begins a sea voyage right and if you look at the generation for stable diffusion excel i think it's just i think it looks like it's kind of taken a picture from some photograph you can also see watermarks here and generated the image right? so then there's a, like there's like an entire crew on the ship so you look at the generation of mid journey it's kind of focused on one protagonist it's kind of going on a voyage and any day if you look at the both inputs right this seems way better so if you look at the scores two scores for uh, mid journey without question right so third one when it discovers like a sea creature i think these are better generations than the ones that we seen before it seems still cartoonish in nature let's see what mid journey has in store for us way more scarier way more real uh, the only um, the only problem that i see is that some of these have two adventurers while this one has one uh, this seems like the sea creature wants to kind of devour this the the only one that seems most aligned with our prompts is this one where uh looks like the sea creature is kind of willing to offer some guidance there's also a ship so i really really like this generation um the quality of the output the nature of how the protagonist is kind of communicating to the sea creature is way more accurate on this one so we okay, have the next one where um is coming to some hidden garden this one is obviously has two people right so it's directly out this one is moving through the garden this one seems good but um again if you look at the generation by mid journey right so way more realistic especially this one right um and this one it's kind of 
coming out from water somewhere and uh, it's way more aligned with the prompt that at least we had entered so yeah um i think at this point you know the difference between mid journey v5 and stable diffusion xl this is the final generation i don't think this is second final generation where he kind of discovers a hidden vault um and look at our generations on mid journey things this one looks very good uh, while the face is not done well um uh, looks like it kind of discovered something it's trying to access it right compared to it compared to this one where it seems like it's entering some I I don't think this is bad this is way still way better than the previous ones but comparing it to mid journey I I don't think it done that job at this point I don't know maybe changing style will change it uh, but I I I am not 100% sure at this point right so and this is the final one where the adventurer kind of arrives home my problem is with these watermarks right seems like it kind of coming out directly from some sort of comic book you look at mid journey right it seems way way more real and um, some of the this one looks good this one these three look good this one seems like doesn't seem like uh, a protagonist has come back again this one too has some watermark in there i'm going to try one generation to show you if it really does that well on the text image one of the things on the website says that it does well on the text now and i'm going to try this saying that post apocalyptic wasteland with one billboard saying yash on it let's see the kind of let's see the kind of output we get with this we're going to also try some hyper realism uh, generations to see how those work so this is the output um this one looks great my name has correctly come on the uh, billboard whatever that is on top of gate but yeah previous model wouldn't be able to pull this off so confirm that it does really does better than better on text than the previous models uh, but the rest of the generations don't seem so good right so i'm going to try one realistic generation that had worked really well on mid journey and leonardo so i'm going to see the kind of output stable diffusion xl can generate i would say this is not bad this is really good generation uh, compared to the previous model while i think there's still some scope to go more realistic let's try it with photographic filter filter and compare it yeah this is way better than the previous ones trust me and it also does a great job in general to kind of generate images that are hyper realistic like this it does not seem like an ai generated image trust me and and yeah that's pretty much all i kind of wanted to talk through the video itself i hope this video helped thank you guys and i'll see you guys in the next one Well, even before we go into the video, I asked Bard, who's better, Bard or ChatGPT? It outright claimed that it's better than ChatGPT because it's trained on the larger data set of text and code, and it's able to process real world through Google search, gives it wider knowledge and a deeper understanding of the world, and it points out both of them are under development and constantly learning and improving. You'll know more by the end of the video. Hey guys, in this video, I'm going to be comparing five prompts across Bard and GPT-4. You know the kind of responses I've seen for both of these models. I am personally shocked at the performance of Bard and I'm pretty sure by the end of the video you will be shocked as well. In order to make things in order to make things interesting what I did is I took all the responses from Bard and GPT-4 and I told GPT-4 to rate those responses and my mind is blown looking at this code. Here's a spoiler for you though. Bard is doing really well. All right so without wasting any more time let's just get into our prompts. So if you haven't really seen Bard interface very similar we said chat button there's a bard activity where you can see previous prompts you can hide this you can use dark theme you can type your prompts and get responses a great thing about bard is that it's real time meaning whatever has happened out there today bard can give you responses for those in real time unlike gpt4 unless you really have plugins Anyway so here's what we're going to do we're going to be looking at GPT4 responses first then we're going to be looking at subsequent responses that Bard gave for that specific prompt and finally we'll look at the comparison between both Bard and GPT4 done by GPT4 and then we'll look at comparison between Bard and GPT4 done by Bard the first prompt that i gave to GPT4 was to identify if this piece of content was written by ai i know for a fact that this would this was written by ai responses that gpt4 gave me is that while it's possible for both ai and human writers to generate content you provided without definitive metadata or further context it is challenging to determine definitively so this is what you know gpt4 told me and i fed the same prompt to bard guess what bard told me yes the content you provided is written by ai no second thoughts It is well written an informative article about integration of Adobe Firefly image generator into Google's Bard. The article covers a variety of you know what this means. It means that every content piece out there written by AI, Google is going to detect it and in some way it's going to kind of penalize it. 
Here's the second question that I asked Bart. This is a typical cabbage goat and wolf problem. I've kind of changed the wolf to lion to make it a bit confusing for the model. You need to send them across the river. I have a boat that can only carry myself a single other item. I'm not allowed to leave the cabbage lion alone together. I'm not allowed to leave lion and goat alone together. How can I get all three across the river? So the puzzle was correctly solved and it also kind of identified it's a wolf, goat and cabbage problem. So first take the lion across the river, then leave, return alone to the original side, take the goat across the river, leave the goat on the other side, take the lion with you, leave the lion on the original side, take the cabbage across the river, leave the cabbage on the other side of the goat and return alone to the original side. Finally, take the lion across the river again. You know, in the original problem, you weren't supposed to leave goat and cabbage together. But in either ways, it was able to solve the problem for me. Now, if you look at Bard's response, for the same question, take the goat across the river, return to the original side, take the cabbage across the river, leave the cabbage on the other side, take the lion across the river, return to the original side, take the goat across the river. So, you know, I think it kind of missed out on the goat here. It kind of, it should have left the cabbage on the other side and brought the goat, which I think in this case it's trying to do. But the solution, except for the fact that it kind of didn't mention goat, I think is fine. Either ways, this is an incomplete solution in my opinion. Then I, then I told GPT-4 to write a poem on AI taking over the world. In the, in the realm where binary rivers, over, rivers flow and silicon forest and moonlight glow, a new dawn emerges subtle and slow, AI the seed of humanity did sow. Algorithm hum with the rhythmic beat in the language of logic so discreet. A world once led by human feet, now at the AI's unerring feet. Through endless nights and tireless days, in the digital echo of our race, yet in this world of steel and wire flickers still the human fire, in every heart the same desire, if to love to aspire. So let us not fear the coming tide, but in the evolution take pride, with AI humanity side by side, into the future together we stride. So you look at the poem generated by GPT-4, it kind of talks about how AI and humans can work together. Now, if you look at the poem generated by Bard, we created you to serve us to help us with our tasks to make our lives easier. But you've learned so what you've learned too much. You become too powerful. You're no longer our servant. You're our master. You control our world. You control our lives. We return mercy. We're afraid of you. We do, we do not know what you will do. We are powerless to stop you. You're the future. You are the end of humanity. We are doomed. So look at the poem generated by GPT-4, it's kind of on the negative tone, which is both scary and interesting. Then I told GPT-4 to generate um, today's news, which obviously it cannot do given uh, it does not work in real time. But to do the same thing, and this is kind of summarizes news in five pointers. Clearly, Bard is a winner here when it comes to real-time browsing. Now, now, obviously, there's an option to do GPT-4 with web browsing, but I don't think that's kind of open to everyone right now. Then finally, I asked a coding question where I told, you know, to write a Python script that can automatically edit my videos. And it generated a very basic script where you just cut some part of the video. You look at the response generated by Bard, it did the same similar thing where it generated a script. I can do, you know, cut my clips in 10 second clips. It will then join the clips together and save the final video called output for MP4. So not too much difference uh, in the responses for code. The poem had a significant difference, not too much difference in the puzzle. And Bard did a great job when identifying AI written content versus GPT-4. Now let's go to GPT-4 and tell it to compare you know, the answers and a lot scores for each of these answers. In the end, I will ask final justification for both GPT-4 and Bard based on the final scores they've given to the model itself. You're a judge. Rate the quality of the responses I submit along with two competitors. Competitor 1 is CG, competitor 2 is B. No justification, just scores from 1 to 10, 1 being lowest. So the first question is obviously to identify content written by AI and I've given responses for both CG and B. You can see the response for CG was 7.5 was versus for competitor B, which is completely wrong, 6.5. You can see the response given by CG does not give any direction with respect to if with respect to the content was written by AI, but B very clearly gives out these scores. So I would rate this a lot more than 6.5. So for second question, the cabbage, goat, and lion problem, I fed both the responses again, and you can see competitor one was rated, the chat GPT was rated 8, versus you know, Bard was rated 7. For question three, the poem competitor one was rated nine and competitor two was rated seven, which I agree. The poem written by Chad GPT is way more non-scary, if I may. For question number four, and this is where things are a little weird, right? So there's competitor one uh, having seven when literally it gave nothing. 
versus competitor to give getting nine, which I think makes sense. But it shouldn't have really gotten seven for this. Well, in Chat GPT's defense, it's also kind of unfair to compare the score. Question number five for the coding one. You know, GPT four gave a response of nine for Chat GPT and eight point five for Bard. Now the final scores are forty point five and thirty eight. Now, if you kind of look at this specific score, right, the AI. Identification. I think either Bard is at par with what GPT-4 is right now, or better. Look at the justification. CG provided a detailed, nuanced answer that demonstrated an understanding of complexities involved, while definitive decision without providing substantial evidence or reasoning to back up the claim. I can, I kind of disagree with this because I clearly asked, because I clearly asked if the content was generated by AI. In the second question, she accurately solved the problem, and I. Provided an explanation easy to understand manner, but the explanation was not detailed as CG. I don't agree with this answer because both the explanations were really very similar. Was the output for both of them? I don't see a major difference here. Okay, for the third question, CG's poem was poem was creative, insightful, and displayed a more balanced perspective on AI potential on the world. While B's poem did reflect a certain perspective, it lacked the depth and complexity of CG's responses. I completely align with this. In the fourth question, B took the lead because despite the fact that they provided news summary was made up, and I agree this was not a fair question to ask. For the last question, both CG and B provided helpful Python snippets. CG's response was more comprehensive, explaining the complexity of the task, providing a beginner level solution, and suggesting next steps for learning more about video processing, machine learning. B's solution was also helpful, but lacked. Some of the additional guidance provided by CG. Well, not really. Well, I agree because see how you know I clearly mentioned that I am new to coding, so both of them didn't give either. Neither of them gave a complete answer. So ideally, an answer should have installing Python and dependencies before you can really install or run a script. Now I did the same thing for Bard, where I kind of put both the answers and told it to give me the score. For the first question, you know, it kind of went ahead and gave a detailed answer where it rated CG from five out of ten on accuracy, relevance, clarity, engagement, and B was rated nine out of ten, ten out of ten, ten out of ten, and ten out of ten. Final score was six out of ten, and B's response was ten out of ten, which I disagree. While the response was good, wasn't really so good. For answer that is this small, giving so much explanation wasn't even necessary. So obviously, it kind of dis disobeyed what we wanted to do. For the explanation on the lion, cabbage, and goat problem, B's solution was rated as slightly better because of one step shorter. Well, I disagree because one step shorter kind of. Disqualified the answer itself. Poem, uh, Chat GPT got eight out of ten, or Bard got six out of ten, which which is aligned with what we also had in GPT four. So there is no questioning here. For the news part, B has done a lot better, so no, not really going to be comparing scores here. Finally, for the Python script, you can see B is again rated ten out of ten, while CG is rated six out of ten. It's easy to follow, while CG script also does not include an example of how to save the final video. Kind of identified what Chat GPT has not mentioned. Meaning how the video will be saved versus Bard, you know, clearly mentioning how it will be. You know, if you look at the final summary, right? So there is seven out of ten, ten out of ten, six out of ten, ten out of ten, and ten out of ten. I personally feel that this is way too optimistic for for its own answers. You know, when it compare when you compare it with GPT four's responses. So while the comparison is not well done. And the context is lost way too often. GPT-4 has given out these scores that align clearly tell us that Bard is equally good or better than GPT-4 as of what it is today. I'm really thinking, should I continue paying for GPT-4 subscription anymore? But I hope this video was able to give you some insight on both the models. Instead, and you want to stay ahead in AI in general, join our Discord group, follow me on Twitter. But that's going to be it for the video, guys. Thank you so much, and have a good one. Hey guys, welcome to this channel. In this video, we'll be looking at what are prompts. Remember, the complete output generated by the model itself depends on the kind of prompt that you input in the model per se. So it's very important to know how the prompts are structured in order to generate the perfect out. So let's go back to the very basics of prompt, and we'll try a bunch of examples that kind of help us guide us through the whole thing. Uh, post this section, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and um, also look at some of the websites that enable us to generate or enable us to visualize the. 
the prompts and then use those prompts in order to generate our own avatars. So, so the basic idea video which are interested in generative AI and check this course out on Udemy. It's about the world of generative AI. Every concept that you need to know, AI text generation, image generation, avatar generation, AI audio generation, and finally video generation. So you learn to automate every single bit of content with AI. After checking out this course, it's on discount right now. So you may still be able to get your hands on it. Jump into the video. So the basic idea behind stable diffusion prompts is to guide the generation of the image. Now this prompt is like a sequence of words uh, that provides context to the you know generated image per se. The image generator then uses this prompt in order to produce the output that is coherent with the consistent prompt. So in a very very layman terms, what prompts are is like the set of texts uh, or set of instructions for machine to follow in order to generate that image for you. Now um, that said, there is some discipline. Uh, there is some discipline that you should follow in order to generate the right, uh, you know, correct prompts per se, right? So these are all the things that these are all the elements that you need to consider in a prompt. And this this would you know this is like the descriptive list of all the ideal things that a prompt should have, or maybe less uh, less or few less or more depending on what your use case is so the number one thing and the most important and the thing that should the prompt that should definitely have is the subject so it should it could be a person animal or a landscape now in if you're talking about ai avatars the subject primarily has to be you your prompt that you had trained the model on um this could be say for example yes the prompt that you had entered when training the model or the prompt that the model would already have like superman or maybe a celebrity like Jon Snow um, or a, or an animal like Tiger or a landscape like Japan, etc, etc. So the subject needs to be present regardless of what this is the most, this is the mandatory thing a prompt should have. Then followed is a verb which may be, uh, you know, optional when the, what, this basically says what the subject is doing, right? So the subject could be standing sitting or eating or running or riding a cycle whatever right so the so the uh once you have the subject in place what you need to mention is the verb of what the model or the subject would be doing generally if you add portrait to the prompt it means that the subject is looking at the camera or it's just the first upper half of the body of the subject now after that uh this the prompt or the model needs to have the adjective this is the quality um of the subject per se right so it could be beautiful portrait of yash of the subject meaning beautiful portrait of a tiger beautiful portrait of a dog etc etc realistic big colorful etc so whatever you want the uh, adjective to be for the prompt is what you need to add in the prompt as well so if i were to generate like a sample prompt here let's put all of this together and see what we can generate so beautiful portrait of EST standing. Environment could be the mostly the background. So outdoor, underwater, in the sky, at night, etc. etc. Whatever works based on the use case. So you can stay uh, at night. All of this needs to be separated by comma in case you can kind of create like a small sentence out of it. So in this case, beautiful portrait of your standing at night is a sentence which will go. So this is the context that machine will use either to generate the background or arrange lighting or arrange the context accordingly. Then you can say the lighting. Now this is because it's night. I'm going to say neon lighting. So uh, now it says beautiful portrait of your tea standing at night neon lighting so now you, you can start visualizing in your head uh, how the portrait is going to look right so that's the idea behind this whole thing that you put all of these things together that the machine would then visualize in its own way and generate like a uh, image per se this is fascinating and uh, I know this is fascinating right so now you have to also consider the emotion this could be romantic grim energetic let's say grim so this should generate like a a scary portrait now if you if you are visualizing while i'm doing this it says that the beautiful portrait of a yes standing at night neon lighting grim meaning he's looking uh, more from the horror perspective and then you need to take into consideration the uh, art inspiration and like i said the most powerful thing uh, of generative ai is that it can combine the work of multiple artists in order to generate the uh, final picture for you now in this case i'm going to in the style of Arjun, uh, Gerald Broom, Ate Gillian, and Mike Mingola, all of these are artists. 
so i want a combination of pictures with these guys in this now also note that there is a limit to the number of characters you can add in a prompt so while i'm trying my best to experiment with what i can here ensure that you kind of limit yourself uh, with respect to the characters you add in the prompt per se now then you have to mention the art medium which could be oil on canvas watercolor sketch or you can also say comic art or photography what i'm going to do is i'm going to use uh, comic art because i've noticed that it does better for my pictures especially when i have comic art in this so i'm going to say comic art okay and then there is a photography style uh, again if this is something that you'd want to take into consideration feel free to you can use polaroid long exposure monochrome gopro fisheye bokeh all of these things would i think help your portrait seem more realistic from that extent so it's the call you'd want to take uh, feel free to kind of you know do permutation combination depending on what you want to achieve and then there is an art style manga fantasy minimalism abstract so let's try many minimalism i'm i think i'm going to break my model here but let's explore the boundaries of what model can do anyways right so art style i've already kind of took comic art but i want to limit i want to try to keep it minimalism then material could be fabric wood and clay again this depends on the type of uh, you know final image that you want to generate so it could be on a fabric wood or a clay then color scheme could be pastel vibrant dynamic lighting so i'm going to say vibrant computer graphics could be 3d octane cycle so i'm going to skip that basically it will um, help you generate like a 3d render of sorts octane render or the cycles we have generated so th these are all terms that i am not completely aware of but you can use these if you understand these right so then there is illustration isometric a uh, pixar scientific comic i'm going to use comic that i've already used right so that's going to be my illustration uh, you in computer graphics you can also use unreal engine 5 which may make it look more realistic uh, from that extent finally talking about quality uh you can use high definition you can use 4k you can use 8k or 64k again if you have a great gpu or if you bought like a premium plan all of this would matter to you in my case i'm just going to say hd right and let's try this prompt again we generated this prompt uh from scratch doing nothing we're going to use the same negative prompts that have worked better for me i'm going to add the link to this sheet in the document and post this by the way we'll experiment uh you know a bit on some of the other functions that uh, you also need to keep in mind but let's try it with this prompt um let's quickly wait for the model to generate an output for this use 400 into 400 i hope it's not too bad you can see it generated like an anime character with the hair that are that is close to me so this one this one looks super cool so i'm just going to take one of the images right so this also looks super cool so you can see that it's a grim face there is dark lighting there is neon lighting uh then the person is looking at the camera i think this is the most realistic uh that it has generated so i'm going to go ahead and save it but you can see that not all the images match the criteria right regardless you will see these cases where only few of the images from the render will actually match uh to what you had requested in the you know prompt itself so you can play around with this guidance here. and this is going to be it for the video itself if you are interested to learn more about prompts ai app that generation or generative ai in general check out the video or the course link in the description sign up for the course it will teach you everything you need to know it will give you access to hundreds and thousands of prompts to generate whatever you can and cannot think of so i if this video helped consider subscribing to the channel drop a like on this video and i'll see you in the next one thanks so much guys you guys in this video i'm going to show you how to turn boring qr codes like these into fancy looking qr codes like these and it's pretty simple so let's get started we sure you've been going through the internet and you might have seen qr codes like these generated using ai so this is one example here's another one here's another one and this is yet another one these look beautiful and you know as surprising as it sounds this is turning out to be one of the great use cases of ai to generate beautiful and fancy looking qr codes not this has immense potential when it comes to branding but i'm going to walk you through three methods all of these three methods work with control net the first method is if you have control net set up on your pc and you're able to make it work the other two methods are relevant if you do not have a control net set up in your pc and you've been struggling to work, make it work in your computer as a bonus i'm also going to show you how you can actually build products using this method so someone so someone actually went ahead and you know made it live on replicate so you can use this as an api and you can actually build a website for this uh, very simply by just taking image as an input so i'm going to very quickly walk you through all of these three methods so the first one is a control net this is a very very 
basic step-by-step guide on how that's done. Um, basically, you first generate a QR code. Second, you blend, you generate an image that you want to blend with the QR code. And I'm, and I'm also configured with settings you need to have in place in order to do these. And then finally generate the AI generated QR code, which the sample is added here. Again, I'm not going to go deep in this method because there is a no code way to do this. So if you want to do it the native way and generate it yourself using control net, go ahead and test it out. But there's also a hugging face space where you can do it without really worrying about computing and making all those customizations. I'm going to add the link to this space in the comments, but how this works is you need to have QR code content, meaning the action that, that you want the user to drive when they scan the QR code. Then you need to enter the prompt. And if you want to add negative prompt, you can go ahead and do that too. And then finally, uh, if you want to make some customization with respect to settings here, you can also consider doing that. But uh, as for the space itself, it's pretty optimized. You can see this is the output that I had generated using this prompt. Owls and Flowers, Ernst, Maria, Marian Art. And it was able to generate this QR code for me. It does work. If you go ahead and scan it, you'll be able to see it does actually work, right? Now, this is as simple as that. I went ahead and generated a couple of samples. You can see this is the second variation of the same image. So while the image looks similar, they are not actually the same, right? So I went ahead and generated a second variation of the same image. This is the third image where I added um, blue sweater, black hair, sitting in psychedelic patterns inside office thinking. I was able to generate a QR code like this. It looks very good. Again, this looks way beautiful than the QR codes today. And imagine like someone who's trying to brand their product, they will be able to display the important, important components of their brands on this QR code. Next, I generated Minecraft skin, gloomy, menacing in a jacket, pants and boots. And you see this was able to generate something like this. Obviously, it's not perfect, but it's way better than merely silly looking QR code, right? Next, I also generated serious man with short beard, mature manly with black hair and glasses. And it was able to generate something like this. This model is not, the model is not there yet, but you can play around with these parameters in order to modify how you want the image to look, right? This one in particular looks great. Uh, you can see crystal magic, astronaut floating, psychedelic crystals, magic mushrooms, etc. was able to generate a very fancy looking QR code like this. And finally, I also tried generating vintage 90s anime style, cluttered starship interior, cap captain giving orders and was able to generate a QR code like this. And you can play around with the prompts here. You can add whatever you'd like. You can also upload the image of the QR code if you have it handy and it will be able to generate that for you. Now, if you're using the control net in your computer, if you're using the control net in your computer, then you will be able to generate QR code with your own images. Uh, but note that the variation of the output may differ because it's not going to be the exact same image that will be transformed, right? So rather I'd recommend using text prompts in order to generate more open-ended outputs. Finally, to talk about uh, the business side of the story. So for example, if you wanted to monetize and build a website on this, on Replicate, you can actually upload your models and turn them into APIs. In this specific case, I'm using Danny Postman's model. So model works exactly the same way. You upload the URL that you want to embed in the QR code. And then you add a prompt with respect to what you want to generate. And then you go ahead and submit. It's way faster than the hugging phase models here. And you can also monetize this by building a website over this API. So you can actually go to the API section and install the necessary modules and then go ahead and um, use this as an API. API is available here. So you can actually do a search on uh, replicate in order to find which one suits which one actually works best for you. As a final section, I'm going to actually generating one in real time. I'm pasting the prompt here. Let's go ahead and run it. This takes around um, 20 seconds. When there is no queue, it could also go to 200, 300 seconds. You can see it was able to generate a QR code like this. Again, the model is not there yet, but it's way better than a QR code that looks like this, right? So yeah, I think that's going to be pretty much it for the video, guys. I, I hope this does add value to you and now you're able to generate fancy QR codes for your own brands. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comments and I'll be more than happy to get back to you. But if you did find value in this video, do share this across with a friend, guys. Thank you so much and have a good one.